My name's Connor. I'm a co-founder of the organization Feminist Internet. Um, to sort of give you a bit of an overview, we were invited by Haunted Machines and Impact Festival. Oh, where's the slides? The cable was loose. Um, so this workshop um, was called Designing an Ecological Alexa. It happened yesterday with 25 participants um, who were a mixture of game design students from HKU um, and also um, applicants from a public call out as well. So we'll get into what we asked them to do a little later on um, and we'll also be able to take a look at what they came up with by the end of the day. Um, but to start with, I'm going to give you a quick overview into um, who Feminist Internet are um, and our previous research into voice interfaces. Um, and then we'll be hearing from Taryn, who's also from Feminist Internet, um, about uh, their research into ecofeminism, which is a new line of inquiry for us at Feminist Internet. Um, and then Natalie and Tobias from Horse Machines are going to give us a presentation that sort of further contextualizes this project. Um, and then afterwards, we'll have talks from Tom and Chris as well, who um, um, are going to tell us about their research in this field and also some of the really brilliant projects that they've initiated as a result. Um, and then finally, we'll take a look at the presentations from the students um, and we'll have the chance to have a quick discussion about those presentations as well. So I think it's going to be great. Um, so, Feminist Internet is a non-profit organization based in London. Um, we are made up of brilliant artists and designers, and our mission is to make the internet a more equal space for women and other marginalized groups as well. And we do this through critical and creative practice. So, we do a lot of things like running workshops, we have a podcast series, we host talks, we host discussions um, on the topic of internet feminisms. Um, some of the topics that we're mainly interested in um, are things like online abuse, which affects all genders, but disproportionately affects women and other marginalized groups as well. Um, the predominance of men and a culture of misogyny within the tech sector itself. Corporate monopolies and their impact on our lives and identities, both online and offline, and also um, negative bias within technologies such as artificial intelligence. So I'm sure some of you are very aware of these topics. Um, they are increasingly covered in mainstream media, but we tend to focus more on generating solutions using our backgrounds in art, design, critical thinking, creative technology, and feminism, rather than reporting on those issues. So we also have a motto. This is the motto. There is no feminism, only possible feminisms. There is no internet, only possible internet. So there are three beliefs that are embedded within this motto. The first is that it recognizes that there are infinite expressions of feminism and depending on which expression you require depends on who you are, what struggles you face as an individual or group, um, and where you are as well. The second belief is that it recognizes the concept of intersectionality um, and centralizes our awareness that gender oppression is only one of many interlocking systems of oppression. Um, and when oppression meets capitalism, su white supremacy or colonialism, for example, it's um, expressed in very distinct ways and impacts on people's lived experiences in very distinct ways. Um, and thirdly, there's a belief that the internet, while it is still um, overwhelmed with issues um, and problems such as oppression or centralization, it doesn't have a fixed future and the, it still holds great potential. So we exist and produce the research that we do because we recognize this potential. Um, whether that's for human connection and liberation, cultural production, positive social change. Yeah, you get the idea. Um, so to give a bit of context for this workshop specifically, um, I'm going to introduce you to a body of work that we've been working on uh, for quite a while now called Designing a Feminist Alexa. Um, so this project is about voice technology, but more specifically, personal intelligent assistance, um, which is what we'll be exploring today and it's what we explored in the workshop yesterday. So we'll be referring to these as PIAs, and we just generally um, define PIA as a software agent that can perform tasks or services for an individual. So it sort of widens that um, scope of um, 
assistance. Like it's, it kind of goes beyond the idea of an Alexa, really. Um, but we use Alexa as a proxy um, for all PAAs because Alexa is very accessible. You could say um, that Amazon is leading the voice tech revolution. Um, everyone seems to recognize Alexa. Everyone, a lot of people have an Alexa. They understand the interactions with Alexa. Um, but voice technology, voice technology has only really just begun and has quite a long future. However, um, the voice of Alexa is in over 20 million objects already, and Siri is in the pockets of 1 billion people um, worldwide. I'm sure it's even bigger now. Um, and the amount of internet-connected devices themselves um, is supposed to actually surpass 28 billion objects by 2022, according to Cisco. So that's sort of going beyond your phones, uh, your tablets, your computers, but the internet is also going into our sunglasses, our light bulbs. Um, Tom is actually going to explore that uh, concept a little later on. But I kind of just wanted to illustrate how vast this emerging field is growing and is exponentially growing all the time. Um, and also to further illustrate the influence of these devices, you could also look at the transformation for e-commerce. Um, voice commerce sales reached $1.8 billion and is expected to reach $40 billion by 2022. Um, you can also look at the act of searching on the web itself. So um, it's going to become much more natural to search with your voice rather than typing. 20% of Google app searches are actually done by voice. Um, and Bing predicts that 50% of all searches on the web will somehow integrate voice um, recognition or um, voice searching or image searching by as soon as 2020. So they're really, they are some really big numbers and they start to raise um, the question of what, responsi what responsibilities do these tech companies have? You know, do they have a responsibility to promote social values? Are they undermining any social values in a way? We're quite interested in these questions. Um, and there's this really brilliant quote from Joy Bulanwini who answers some of these questions or starts to, starts to, starts to um, pick at them. If we fail to make ethical and inclusive artificial intelligence, we risk losing gains made in civil rights and gender equity under the guise of machine neutrality. So this started to get us thinking at Feminist Internet, well, okay, could we make a feminist version of Alexa? Is that something we could do? What would that sound like? What would it look like? Um, what functionalities would it have? Does it even need to be an Alexa? Um, here's a quick audio clip from um, another co-founder of Feminist Internet, Dr. Charlotte Webb, who initiated the project um, back in 2017. And she's just going to explain really quickly why, we th why she thinks we need a feminist Alexa. We desperately need feminist Alexa because there's a real urgency to push back against... Yeah, there we go. That would help. Technical issues. Yeah, you can hear. Okay, I'm going to see if I can do this in 10 seconds. Headphone port. Oh, you needed a wiggle. We desperately need Feminist Alexa because there's a real urgency to push back against monopoly corporations that are producing technologies and also techno-social relations that are so intertwined with the profit motive that they actually forget to recognise that they could serve a higher purpose. The reason why I think this is a feminist issue, feminism, at least in my understanding, really intersects with other structures of oppression like capital, so part of the fight is about offering alternatives to that. So we created a previous version of the workshop that we ran yesterday called Designing a Feminist Alexa, as I mentioned before. Um, and we focused our critique during that workshop um, more with a gender lens. So we were sort of questioning why those assistants are gendered the way they are. You know, they're generally characterized as female. Um, there's a lot of critique um, being done around this because, um, of course, this can reproduce negative uh, gender stereotypes. Um, but long story short, 
we asked those workshop, workshop participants to create an alternate PIA um, using what we call feminist design standards, which we'll get into a little later on. Um, so that brings us to this workshop. Um, we wanted to see if we could bring that critical thinking around voice interfaces and use it within, um, use it with a focus um, on environmental issues instead. So this workshop in a nutshell is about uncovering the enormous impact of internet connected technologies and what, um, yeah, what effect they have on the environment, um, what steps and considerations can designers and artists take um, in order to minimize that impact. Um, I'm sure some of you have seen or heard of the recent UN report that uh, outlines the alarming fact that in order to avoid the irreversible catastrophic damage to the planet, uh, this requires us to change our behaviors um, and economy at a speed that um, has no documented historic pre precedent. So um, I guess we wanted to explore how technology contributes considerably to this issue. Uh, so we invited Tom and Chris um, to share their knowledge on the subject. Um, we'll be hearing from them a little later on so they can share that knowledge too. Uh, before we get into those talks though, um, let me give you a quick look at the brief that we set the participants yesterday. So the brief was to design a personal intelligent assistant that meets an ecological need and promotes environmentally conscious design. So we wanted them, the participants to do this in one day. Um, and we helped them with this by developing a set of eco-feminist design standards, um, which sort of helped us think through questions like, what user groups are we designing the technology for? How does the design and representation of idea um, help reduce energy use and so on and so on? Um, I'll be expanding on those a little later on when we're looking at the projects again. Um, but for now, that is me. Um, I'm going to hand over to Tara now, who um, will introduce us to ecofeminism and how feminist issues are inherently linked to uh, the environmental situation that we are currently in. So I'm going to hand over to Taryn. Uh, okay, uh, thanks everyone for having us for the past couple of days. Can you hear me okay? Can you tell I don't really enjoy this kind of thing, but we'll, we'll get there together. Um, yeah, it's been a really fantastic couple of days. Um, we're going to take a slight, slight sidestep out of some of these really important practical questions that everyone's been asking. Um, so the environmental and ecological focus for the feminist internet is quite a new line of inquiry and I've just joined onto the feminist internet now having been um, where you guys are sitting for a long time following their work um, and it's been really nice to kind of contribute my work as more of a kind of artist, uh, speculative researcher so I'm here to talk a little bit about what ecofeminism is. Um, but first, I'm going to ask, answer this question, which is, what constitutes a human? Um, so the basis of a lot of third and fourth wave feminism, so the current wave of feminism and third wave, so people like Judith Butler, uh, Donna Haraway in the last sort of 20 years, um, that includes feminism, uh, eco-feminism, centers around the fact that the reference point for the human being is not a universally applicable subject. In fact, it's quite specific. Lovely diagram, I love this diagram. Um, I'm gonna use the human with a capital H and human being. Hopefully we can kind of figure out what the separation between those things is. So when I talk about the human, I'm talking about this specific figure here. Human beings, I'm talking more about us as a, as a species and how we behave. Um, but yeah, so this, this sort of non-universal subject that we've placed at the center of our society, the human, is male, white, Western, heterosexual, wealthy, and without disability. Uh, the patriarchal society, the capitalistic society that we know, places the singular figure of the human being at the center, making it the dominant force of power in our society. So even those who are scientifically considered a member of the human species are therefore culturally, socially, and economically dehumanized, so non-humans, um, non-human others. 
They're inferior and subservient to this figure of the human, comparatively lacking in rights, opportunity, and representation, frequently controlled, abused, and exploited. Therefore, as women, queers, indigenous communities, people of color, and so on, ecofeminism states that this condition already connects us with other non-human subjects, such as technology, plants, animals, and ecosystems. Uh, in the canon of Western philosoph philosophy, frequently cited humanist philosophers like Rene Descartes, who was uh, who was, is, uh, rather worryingly called the father of mod modern philosophy, connected the male to the rational mind, singling them out as a kind of separate and higher intellectual, uh, higher intellectual being. Meanwhile, the female is historically more connected with nature. And this is drawing several direct contrasts, the mind versus the body and logic versus emotion. Of course, we can and probably should argue against these problematic dichotomies anyway. But ecofeminism has explored how this embodied and emotional approach might in fact empower us, be affirmational, and suggests how we can find value and affect change through our implicit connection with nature and other non-human subjects. Ecofeminism argues that our desire to control and dominate nature thus far is what has caused the majority of environmental crises that we currently face on our planet. Uh, this lack of care for our planet has made us feel entitled to use up precious resources, hunt animals to extinction, and fill the land with waste that will outlive generations of us without consideration for the consequences of these actions. Uh, I like this title, thinking about the environmental crisis as an ecosystem itself. So thus far, the human domination of our planet has been responsible for unprecedented ecological crises. Uh, you, I'm sure in the room you've heard the term Anthropocene, anthro coming from the Greek referring to the human being, and Anthropocene describing the period of uh, geological time on Earth in which human activity has had a significant impact upon various factors um, such as ecosystems, the climate, seasonality, uh, temperature, and so on. Uh, the unusual but ever more frequent ecological events and crises that we're witnessing are rarely categori categorizable into incidents that solely affect animal or plant life versus human life. They're instead complex issues in which different non-human subjects are inevitably intertwined. To take you back to our diagram. Uh, the current environmental crisis is in fact an intersectional issue because it's experienced differently depending on a person's position as a member of one of, or several of these marginalized groups. Uh, those who are most responsible for the ecological crisis and those who bear the brunt of it are certainly not one and the same. Marginalized groups, the poor who are unable to escape their precarious living and working conditions, indigenous communities whose rights to their land which they've lived on for thousands of years are next to non-existent, uh, and often women who, particularly in the global south, predominantly work in low-wage jobs on the land or are responsible for fetching water for their families or communities, disproportionately experience the effects of climate change, destructive environmental practices and irresponsible waste disposal methods. Um, yeah, it's quite a commonly known fact now that for the last 40 or 50 years, our contingency plan for the fact that we were living amongst too much of our own waste was just to ship it off to another country where we could no longer see it and felt that that was a sufficient way of dealing with it. Um, contributing to, uh, you know, to millions of people around the world living amongst our rubbish in the global south. Uh, the recent fires consuming the Amazon rainforest, I think are a perfect illustration of the intersection of non-human suffering. The lungs of our planet are burning. Millions of trees that absorb the carbon dioxide that we're producing are being consumed by flames. Uh, the most diverse, uh, biodiverse place on Earth where entire spe in species and ecosystems are being wiped out every single day. The reason that they started, a lot of people think it was climate change that started these fires, in fact, that they were deliberately set by farmers who wanted to clear the land for livestock. They've actually been burning for 10 years. This isn't a recent issue. Um, so they've been burning uh, perpetually, partially because of the, um, 
because they were set deliberately. That's changed the climate and uh, the humidity, which allows it to keep burning without further fueling. And also, um, the Brazilian government has a vested interest in the capital that's brought in by these livestock uh, farms being introduced, and so they've made no efforts to stop them from happening. And uh, finally, the entire time, the indigenous people that have lived on that land, whose homes and entire livelihoods have been destroyed by these fires, have been campaigning to stop them, and they've not been listened to, because their voices are considered of less value than the descendants of the colonizers that live in South America. Uh, so how can a feminist strategy help us to tackle the climate crisis? Well, simply put, just like the fight for gender, racial and sexual equality, winning the fight to stop climate change cannot be done within the existing conditions that we have created on our planet. Ecofeminism sits at the intersection of feminism and environmental advocacy. So in order to resolve the challenges that we face, be they social, cultural, economic or environmental, we need huge systemic change. A shifting of our values and a radically different approach to living and being. Ecofeminists uh, would say, like Donna Haraway, uh, would say that one, we need an approach that is embodied, embedded, intersectional and sustainable, showing greater care and empathy for all creatures, cyborgs and other non-human beings alike. Thank you very much. Thanks, Taryn. So we have um, a very, very, very uh, small slot, around two minutes for any questions for Taryn. We'll have um, some small slots after each talk, um, but also we'll have a larger slot later on for a QA. and a So is there any burning questions? It's a poor choice of word. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, round two. Um, I'm, I'm, it was really fascinating to see that structure and that breakdown, which is really clear and explains something that, that even as an academic, I found to be quite difficult to navigate. How do you? How do we? How do you see this? Um, work in these frameworks materializing into real change, either in policy or activism or anywhere else? Um, I mean, that's the, the question, maybe the one that, oh, where am I looking for? The, so this diagram here. Um, I suppose a lot of this is starting from changing our kind of own personal understanding of our relationship with how we are, effect, are affecting our planet. I think we really see ourselves as um, I think we're just constantly putting out fires. If we're not thinking about ourselves as part of an ecosystem, then we're sort of constantly acting without a more conscious approach to uh, to how we might live our lives. So I think when we've got more researchers who are looking from an eco-feminist or post-human approach, um, there's a sort of greater consideration for... Um, I know the yeah. This is a terrible answer to your question. The, the yeah, the the, um, the different kinds of effects that our actions are taking. Of course, that requires um, people who are coming from that philosophical background and then speaking with people who are scientists who can then sort of introduce the facts um, that back that approach up. Um, Maybe. Just to kind of add on to that, I mean, one of the, qu the discussions that we had yesterday with the students, or mentioned yesterday, was the, the difference between the burden on the individual versus the burden on big companies and big things. So sure. how would you, I mean, obviously I'm not asking you to explain that <laughs> and, and to completely solve it, because no, yeah. I think if we did, we wouldn't be in this position. Um, but how do you push more feminist strategies on those bigger companies? So obviously we can do as much as we can in terms of our own agency, but there is a, there's also like a a top-down change that needs to happen as well, or top change? Yeah, of course. I mean, say what you will about Extinction Rebellion, which, especially when we're talking about issues of intersectionality, is not the the most uh, the best example, in my opinion, of, of what that might look like. However, in terms of uh, the disruption that's been caused by their, their actions, 
um, the school strikes that are growing in number. I mean, this is how you get people to start to stand up and listen. And and um, hopefully it's those kinds of gestures that are actually ge like genuinely disruptive and visible that will hopefully start to uh, change the consciousness of the way that people, so people in power might be behaving, but also I think for us it's really about who we choose to put in put in power when we when we have the opportunity to do that anyway is taking another look at who we want leading our country um that that might offer up better alternatives than certainly the people that are in charge at the moment thank you thanks tyrant okay so i'm now going to hand over to <coughs> natalie and tobias if you'd like to take the stage All right, we're gonna we're gonna split this. It'll be good. Um, thanks, Connor. Thanks for um, having us. Um, just for a little context, um, we uh, Haunted Machines is Natalie Kane and Tobias Revel, and we've been working uh, with Impact for a number of years now, who are incredibly supportive of our kind of ideas and what we've been doing. And, and when um, uh, we were asked about if we wanted to do a little activity that tied into the theme of this year's festival, which is around interfaces, we thought. Um, I immediately thought of the work of Feminist Internet, which comes from University of Arts London, where I also work, and I've been working with Charlotte since they sort of started to incept in 2017-ish, um, and uh, sort of going to them and saying, well, what if we took some of those principles that are now pretty established and are, are baked into certain areas of the university and the curriculum and sort of extended them into an ecological uh, plane, and that was really exciting, so then this workshop was developed. But the ambition of this type of work is to extend the opportunity, the platform, and the privilege we have as people who have a good network and are able to um, use our resources in interesting ways to do things that are more than intellectual vanity that are actually about developing things for change. So the work that, that, that the team did yesterday will be written up and go into some exciting teaching and learning report with the ambition that it will start to affect the teaching of the subject of technology across the entire University of Arts London. Um, and that's a commitment that, that the university also supported this project has made towards changing the way that we approach the material world. Um, so that's the context for why we wanted to do this. So I'm going to hand over to Natalie now, who's going to talk for a while. Um, yeah, well, you can introduce Haunted Machines, it'll be fun. Um, this is a very high microphone. See, there we, there we go. Um, so we're Haunted Machines. We've been uh, working together f since about 2014. Uh, initially started with a conference in which me and uh, Tobias and a number of others were thinking about why people were talking about technology in terms of math magic and mythology and starting to think through what, uh, why people to kind of use it as a default strategy to cope with kind of massive technological change or things that might be kind of questioning them either on a very kind of funny way like why is Instagram listening to me is my phone haunted to um, the system systematized kind of violence and oppressions on marginalized groups by the instrumentalization of huge data sets and things like predictive policing so that that scale was something that we kind of we looked at but then it kind of ended up being something more around narrative and rhetoric around technology so why do we default to certain types of explaining things to each other or or talk about technology in particular ways and and we kind of We've left the magic stuff probably in in a, in a box now, in a black box. It's on a website. And it's on our website. You can read all about our work there. Um, and we've moved on a bit to look more specifically at narratives and things that we've been really interested in recently is things like machine learning and CGI and the impact of that. Um, and a number of other things, and the, the it, mostly the ecological problem that we're dealing with, new technologies in particular. So... We wanted to focus a bit on this, and as we know, I mean, this is a great actually image. I didn't know Tobias had done this until I, I remembered earlier. This is from uh, the runoff of a rare earth magnate plant that batteries are made of in China. So that basically, this tube is coming straight from a factory and going straight into a lake, which will never be populated by any living thing, probably beyond like I don't know, extremophile tardigrades or something. I'm not sure. Um, but again, it's a very visceral and very um, Big impact of the, the, the stuff your phones have batteries which create this mess. Um, but more about data, because data is apparently not a material thing, which is completely untrue. Um, there's definitely a an idea that data is some sort of a immaterial force that drives the fun kind of functions and services that we do. Obviously, it's not. We know it's not. Um, data centers are a huge like, like uh, 
ecological problem. For example, in 2016, the world's data centres use more than Britain's entire electrical consumption. Uh, they're set to, and, and sorry, they are set to account for 3.2 percent of the total worldwide carbon emissions by 2025. And something that I was reading about quite recently is um, the energy that's used, the carbon footprint of training neural networks and machine learning data sets. So ones like the Alexa, um, in training one of those alone, just one. Um, it takes 284 tonnes of carbon, the same as the entire lifetime footprint of five cars functioning all the time, which when you kind of start to put it in those material terms, you start to realise what the actual weight of this can be and you understand why 10% of the world's energy at some point it will be generated by the kind of the proliferation of data. Um, the issues with data is that there is a, a spectacle problem with it in some ways. Like we, the ways that we try and communicate this data in these numbers is through things like graphs. Graphs are quite difficult and quite sciencey, so we do data visualizations, and often these can be quite. They're trying to be helpful, but often they kind of obfuscate <laughs> behind layers because it's a form of, of natural impulse that we as humans to tell stories to kind of gain control of information and make us feel a little bit less. Um, helpless and seeing it, seeing them at scale as or at Halpern wrote in Beautiful Data um, that they can act as a metaphor for knowledge and for the command over a world beyond our outside subjective experience and obviously we have a very subjective experience of the world and, and don't have anything other than that and the idea of using data and numbers as a way to try and crunch through it, it becomes a narrative that we instrumentalise in order for us to not kind of, to feel like we're in control which is a difficult, we're in a difficult time in society where feeling like we're in control of something that's huge and unfathomable and tangible at times unless you're living in Bangladesh and your 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 village is going underwater um it's quite different and by um but the choice to reveal and, and by whom matters in the control that we're allowed and I've been quite interested in watching Amazon's narrative around their carbon footprint so they've been for a number of years they've been asked can you just re reveal your carbon footprint and they keep saying yeah, yeah we'll get to it we'll get to it we'll do it it's fine and they took ages and ages and ages um Jeff Bezos who's worth 113 billion dollars he is the richest man in the world uh, finally got around to it it's like oh well we was hire some people to do it um, but in disclosing their carbon footprint, it did a really interesting thing, was not essentially an admission of guilt, but a performance of accountability and the idea of that they are doing something. Does, but they, they, they probably, they might not be. They say like, oh, we're going to be thinking more green solutions and that kind of thing. But actually, 44, this is 44 million metric tonnes, by the way. This is not 44 tonnes, this is 44 million is their carbon output for 2018. That's one year, which is the same, the same carbon output as Finland just for comparison. Um, and it's it's quite an interesting way that they're using data in a way to simultaneously kind of say, oh, we're going to be, going to be accountable and we are taking this seriously. And even the name of the website that it's from is sustainability.amazon.co.uk. Um, we had quite an interesting discussion yesterday about the word sustainability, which I know Tobias is going to go into a little bit more later. Um, but it's the idea of like of them doing something but and showing data and using data as a tool to tell a story about themselves which kind of moves it away from them and i've always been really interested in data visualization um as a as a tool for, for narrative because it's not just objectively showing data it's to, it's telling a story that you choose to tell about data um this is a really great um comparison uh, from uh, Andy Cockgrove. So basically on the left it, in 2011 for the South China Morning Post, Simon Shah produced a visualisation called Iraq's Bloody Toll based on the number of casualties that had happened um, both from civilians, I, th I, th I think it's civilians and army personnel, I, 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 I can't remember which one it is, but it's a total toll of deaths from Iraq and he basically said, but if you flip the graph and you change the colour it goes from being a very, very negative looking thing to a very positive looking thing and it depends what story you want to tell and I'm always really intrigued by how um, data is not an objective thing, as we all know. It's not a neutral thing. It's something that can just be used like, like the, the ways that we kind of talk about news stories and that kind of thing. Um, and this is really important, particularly the time that we have now, where we have uh, narratives around climate change and more specifically it's denial because of the language used to obscure and then the data that's misread or deliberately misread or read in different ways. And there's a, there's a, a guy called Thomas Schelling, he wrote a really interesting book called Strategy and Conflict. He's the guy basically who apparently de-escalated the Cold War. He, in his strategy team, used to essentially kind of say to people, okay, so when we're all in a group of people, we tend to all kind of ratify our own decisions, the same decisions of the group. But we need to have one of you to have a look at that information and read it differently. 
differently. And using the same information, you have to read it and then convince the others to, to take a different path. And obviously he was in a wartime situation. He was perhaps being a bit, he didn't anticipate Donald Trump doing it. Um, but it's it's another way for us to, have, to really think about, okay, if this is happening and this narrative is happening and this data is being used in this way and we think of data as being objective and that science is, will all, all get us through, that it's not just science that we need, it's also narrative and, and storytelling and, and as I'd argue, perhaps more active um, forms of that so which is why the guardian changing a style guide to say climate crisis and global and uh, climate warming was so important because it was a very active direct stand by saying like we need to pay attention to this we need to be provocative we need to make statements it's not kind of going oh well maybe if we just publish right stories it's changing the literal language and the rhetoric around it um and the idea of being active and reinforcing behaviors in that way and taking command i mean obviously the guardian have got their criticisms in lots of ways but this was a particularly important stand because style guides are the things that all journalists refer to in order to, to talk about their work. And I'm going to hand over to Tobias now to talk more about other things. <laughs> so yeah, there we go, climate stuff. Yeah. It's all highly planned at 20 past three. Um, so for me, there's, there's, there's a, a, a very difficult tension in the act of creativity and the drive to be more ecologically responsible. I, 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 something in me doesn't respond well to the word sustainability, and I, I'm interested in exploring that a bit. Part of this, um, David Graeber outlined as any creative act is the promise of future production, and that necessarily creates debt. And if you take that ecosystem that was demonstrated earlier uh, and break it down, it's essentially about the displacement of debt in a way, right? It's about putting certain people in debt ecologically, financially, technologically to others so that there is uh, a, a social inequality that creates uh, a notion of progress. <laughs> so there's a problem there. The other problem is that when design and the technosphere more broadly seeks to attempt to encounter sustainability, they tend to do it in this way, um, which is using the sort of methods of data reductionism that Natalie was describing, but also putting all the onus on the individual to change, right? All of these services, and you know, none of them are particularly named, but I'm sure we're familiar with them, are about blaming the individual for everything that's wrong. You need to change, you need to consume less energy, you need to go vegan, you need to travel less. Now that's important, but there is also the wider ecosystem to consider, and the ecosystem of businesses, policy, and the world itself, that when you start to look at it that way, the hypocrisy of these kind of services begins to be exposed. As we know from yesterday, the news coming out that, that Google have been funding climate change denial because for them it's about uh, continuing to maintain conservative support for laws that prevent scrutiny of, their, of the Telecommunications Act that allows Google to make revenue in the way it does. Um, equally, other companies have previously been caught out doing similar things. The political system is uh, is geared in such a way that that is always going to happen. That hypocrisy is always going to be nascent in the ecosystem. We're always going to see it, and we can't sort of isolate that and blame any particular individual for it because it's not an individual's fault. It is a systemic issue, as identified earlier. So then, you know, if, if design sits and creativity sits at this tension of only really being able to act at the interface of the person and the system, i.e. by creating literal interfaces or, or signs or, or trying to convince and change behavior, but also in its act of being creative creates debt, which creates more unsustainable practice, what can be done? Um, just a quick nod to a project I did very recently. Yeah, it's just the sound of the machine. So, so my problem with the word sustainability comes from a narrative that is in the design world and in the business world of sustainability being about continuing to behave the same. So it's about switching out your soap brand, it's about um, uh, switching out your uh, food for organic food and continuing to maintain the same level of disengagement with the wider system. It doesn't, it doesn't confront you with the problem, it tries to push it out of your sight by, by displacing the moral imperative to um, perform more responsibly. So this was a project I did with uh, my regular collaborator Wesley Goatley and a, and a brilliant painter called Charlie Peters where we were interested in exploring greenwashing essentially. So um, a term borrowed from uh, a lot of critique of um, uh, environmental activism is charismatic megafauna, that often it is the larger animals that become the symbols of extinction, things like pandas or whales, whereas hundreds of thousands of species of insect are going extinct all the time and they're never kind of looked at. And green equally is deployed as a colour uh, to bring us into, to, to present some form of responsibility on the behalf of particularly uh, corporate entities and um, 
folks who are somewhat culpable in the environmental crisis. Um, so basically what happens in this project, a machine runs across this painting, uh, this beautiful painting by Charlie Peters, uh, and it has been trained on a um, neural network of 102,000 images of green that we scraped from Google. And as it goes across the painting, it tries to find the nearest match from the database to the painting. Because the other layer of criticism in this project was about saying that when we look to technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning, which are embedded in products like Nest, which claim to create more uh, ecologically sustainable behavior, they are another way of displacing responsibility by saying this higher intelligence, this artificial intelligence can create meaning and make sense of the world for me. And the truth is, um, it, it can't. It is just a doing pattern recognition and you still have to confront your own responsibility. So where does design and creativity then have a place to act. So for instance, design is often described as the cunning use of the material world to create change, the reorganization of the things in the world to create new behaviors. Yeah, I'm not gonna unpack that too much, but for the sake of this, that's a good description. So for instance, following the NSA, uh, the revelations of NSA spying by Edward Snowden in 2013, there was a petition to elected officials in Utah to cut off the water supply to the data centers. The, uh, because the NSA is a federal institution, the local government has no ability to control where the NSA is and what the NSA does, but they can control the water supply. So by cutting off the water supply, they threatened uh, the existence of the NSA's continued actions because they need water to cool their data centers. It's an understanding of the ecosystem as a whole, not just trying to target the individual responsibility inside it. And that kind of attitude I'm starting to see more and more in the work of the people around me. So, so Julian Oliver's Harvest, for instance, from two years ago, uh, he's, he's become a sort of ecological technical activist in lots of different and interesting ways, was a, a computer that uses wind power to mine cryptocurrency that's then reinvested into green technology, right? So it's understanding the components of wind, uh, the cryptocurrency market, and how and an investment strategy that in creating a piece of critical art that engages people in those ideas also has a practical application. The project that I did with Wesley and Charlie consu has consumed already around eight or nine kilograms of carbon. Sorry, it's produced around eight or nine kilograms of carbon. So we are already culpable by creating these critical works. And then finally, one of my favorites that uses a kind of creative cunning to bring change is this project by Peter von Tiesenhausen. I don't know the title of the artwork, but he's talked about it quite a bit. He, um, is, he owns quite a large tract of land in Canada where um, there's a lot of indigenous folk and uh, uh, I'm sure we remember from the news there was an attempt to build a gas pipe straight across the land and into, um, into uh, Ocean Port. Um, so he became a land artist and he created this project where he started putting picket fences down and saying it's art. And that meant under Canadian law he was allowed to charge the company $25,000 per acre if they wanted to dig it up rather than the $500 they were offering him. Um, and he also started charging the gas company a consultancy fee every time they came around to harass him to sell, him, sell them his land. So again, it's not going, this is the individual at fault, I'm going to sit here and blame them until they change. It's going, okay, let's zoom out and look at the system, look at where the KPIs and the imperatives for everyone involved are and change it so that we get a more favorable outcome. In this case, understanding how land is valued. Um, so I guess that's, that's kind of it, backing up a little what was said earlier about the system and also trying to think about where we're culpable and what we do have in our toolbox to help create change. Yeah, thank you. Are we doing questions? No? Yeah. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Or we can revisit this later on. Yeah? Okay. Thanks. Bro. Thank you. Okay. So next we have Tom, who is going to walk us through some of the insights that he shared yesterday. Awesome. Um, so my name is Tom Jarrett, I'm an interaction and digital product designer, so I've been working on digital products and apps since the first iPhone came out. Um, I work for a design studio in, Normally, uh, in London called Normally, and we've done kind of digital products and services for people like Facebook and BBC or Spotify. We also have um, a kind of something we call a data expedition where we look and investigate data as a material for building products and do our own kind of internal research and experiments to try and understand 
how data kind of works and exploring the material properties. So this is just some of the stuff that I've kind of come across in over the last year or two. And some, we've covered some of this already in some of the talks, but I'll just go through it really quickly and as an experiment at the end as well. So I don't think it's going to be news to anyone here that we're currently in a climate emergency. It was declared by the UK in May and Utrecht in July as well. I think Connor mentioned earlier we've got 11 years left, apparently, according to the UN, to make, make change before irreversible damage occurs. I think basically this is just saying that the current ideology of strategy of infinite growth is just not feasible. And it's been said that we're the first generation that's going to feel the full force of climate change and almost certainly the last that's going to be able to do anything about it. So why does this matter to us? The tech industry has the same carbon footprint as the airline industry. And as Tobias and Natalie mentioned, data centers are consuming 3% of the global electricity and accounting for 2% of greenhouse gas emissions. In Silicon Valley, data centers appear on the state government's toxic air contaminant treaty. And it's been forecast that a tsunami of data could consume a fifth of all global electricity by 2025. And there's a graph as well that kind of breaks it down a little bit more, but you can see that the biggest increase is data centers and like networks wired and wireless. And this is also because connected devices are on the rise, as was also touched on earlier. So expected to hit about 30 billion in the next few years. Some estimates have even put it at 50 billion, I think. But this is because of Internet of Things, wearable technologies, smart homes, smart cities, cloud gaming. There's just so many different things that we're now kind of connecting, and it's just ever expanding. This is really well illustrated by the Amazon Alexa announcement that was last month. So Alexa is now finding its way into speakers, uh, face glasses, rings, earbuds, doorbells, microwaves, clocks, bedside lamps, and dog collars. There's also the many connected devices that sink into the background of our everyday life that we don't really think about. So this is like smart meters, video surveillance, facial technology, healthcare monitoring, transport. There's also like things in packages that track your Amazon delivery. And there's just so many things that we just don't even take into account. And in the Mary Meeker's Internet Trend Report this year, she, um, they kind of estimated that we're around 1,500 data interactions per connected person per day. And that's estimated to balloon in the next five years to nearly 5,000, which is a pretty staggering amount per person. As also touched on earlier, new technology is going to contribute just as much. It's not helping the things we're adding to the kind of current ecosystem like AI, machine learning, cryptocurrency. They're all kind of drawing lots of energy and adding to the existing energy drains that we already have. So the carbon footprint of the AI, for example, is five times the emissions of a, uh, of a lifetime of a car. Five times, yeah. So with all this in mind, the prediction is that the billions of devices that we use every day could end up hitting 3.5% three, three of global emissions within 10 years, and by 2040, as much as 14%. And in Japan, predictions are that by 2030, digital services are going to require more power than the nation itself can even generate. Which leads us to the obvious question that what about sustainable data centers? And Amazon and Google have got lovely certificates saying that they've got sustainable energy sources, but the actual reality is that it's an incredibly complicated mix of clean energy generated from their own kind of sources, taking power off the grid at certain times of surges, and basically just buying certificates that announce their 100% sustainability. Um, there's a guy called Ian Bitterin, who's a UK expert on data centers, and he's done some interesting kind of stuff around this. But he says there is a movement towards sustainable data centers, but the development that's already underway has much further to go to offset the exponential growth in internet traffic. And it's really this data f um, explosion that is the problem. So the data to and from data centers, we've got around 2007 is 50 EB, and then in 10 years it ballooned to 1.1 ZB, which is a zettabyte, apparently, which is a trillion gigabytes. Um, by 2025, we expect to hit 125 times what we're at there. So that's 125 times a trillion gigabytes. There's all these numbers are just so ginormous, it's kind of hard to kind of put it into anything feasible. But there's um, 
a lot of this infrastructure is just growing and it's causing a lot of new buildings, a lot of new physical infrastructure in the world, from the fiber optic cables that run through the Atlantic and the vast data centers. It's led companies like Microsoft and various others to kind of sync data centers and start experimenting with other ways of cooling them. So this is Microsoft's data center that they sunk off Scotland. So it's just sitting underwater now, pumping out its heat into the sea, warming up the, the uh, area around it. There's also um, some experiments in the Arctic. So this is northern Sweden. And it's actually called the Node Pole. And there is an uh, ice sculpture of a Facebook-like button. And this is an actual real photo. So Amazon and Facebook are going to the Arctic. They're building data centers because it's cooler there, cheaper to cool it, and more efficient for them. The problem is, as Lars Scheiden says, as the CEO of Eco Data Center in the Arctic, is that all the heat that they're generating is just being thrown out the window. So if you want palm trees in northern Sweden, that's great. But if you want to maintain the climate around it, then we should be converting that heat into something else. He actually does something where they use their excess heat and they kind of mash it with high pressure and wood shavings to make energy pellets. And then they reuse that to kind of heat housing in the area. But that is very much the exception rather than the rule. So near where I work in Shoreditch, I saw some guy wearing a t-shirt that just said, there is no cloud, it's just someone else's computer. I think it pretty much as a summary kind of sums up the issue that a lot of the language we use around tech makes it seem like it's not physical. It's the cloud, it's something else, it's just there and it's on the internet. But the problem is it's us as much as the data centers. The data centers are a necessity because of our digital consumption. So it's things like social media, mobile phones, films, pornography, gambling, dating, shopping. These are the things that we're consuming and we're putting the demand out there for increased energy in data centers. The music industry is an amazing example. So in theory, the music industry should be great. We're streaming, we're not making loads of plastic. It's no more CDs, no more vinyl, great for the environment. But actually, from a recent study that came out in Glasgow this year, we're actually at the worst point of carbon emissions in the music industry that we've ever had in the history of music. So 1977, vinyls peak, 2000, CDs peak, and then this is now. And this is purely just because we're just streaming everything. At least when you have a CD, you can put it in, you've bought it once, it's made of plastic, but you can play it over and over and over again. But we're just playing songs and just streaming them and loading them relentlessly all through the day. So it's estimated to be about between 200 million kilograms and 350 million kilograms a year in the US alone. Charging up a single tablet or a phone is like negligible energy. It's, but if you watch an hour of video a week, which I'm sure we all do and more, um, that's more energy annually than two refrigerators. And even if the tech industry was able to kind of shift to 100% renewable, the volume that we would need would just put intolerable strain on the world's energy systems, which we need for everything. So in summary, the problem is that the current trend for digital overconsumption in the world is just not sustainable with respect to the supply of energy and materials that it requires. So what can we do? So it feels like instead of gambling on the kind of hypothetical development of a post-scarcity world where we've got abundant energy, sustainably resourced, and we can kind of build and do whatever we want, then maybe we need to start preparing for a post-abundance world, one where our unlimited, our unlimited desire for everything, anytime, all the time, is replaced with maybe a more sustainable approach in how we consume digital products and services. And it feels to me that this kind of ties in with the trend towards digital well-being at the moment. So that's the guy from Facebook, I think his name's Antonio Garcia Martinez, who criticized Facebook and the tech industry and then went to live in a yurt in the middle of the forest with no, no internet and no phone. And they've all kind of got screen time stuff, help monitor your use, let's try and get you off the phone as much as possible. But ultimately, this is the attention economy. Every single one of these companies make money off you using your phone and keeping you glued to it. That is their fundamental business model. So it feels kind of a bit rich. A lot of digital products are designed specifically to keep users' attention, and they're unnecessarily bloated. So it got me to thinking in my job, how can we think, rethink how we're designing, or I'm designing these products, and how can they be more data sustainable? And it really felt to me like this needs to be progression and not regression. I, just, I don't think we're in a position where we can start trying to take things away from people that we've already got. And there's obviously amazing benefits from the internet, and it's great. We don't want to just say, Let's not use this, let's not do that. But 
I think it's kind of comparable to flight. So there's a growing non-fly movement between young people, and that is great. But it feels like a lot of people aren't willing to give up flying. Um, but maybe the answer lies in things like Bernard Pickard's um, solar-powered flight, where, yeah, you might be able to fly, but it might just be once every two years, and it's going to be extremely expensive and solar-powered. Maybe we just have to just learn to be able to have things in smaller amounts. So that got us thinking normally about doing some provocations and experiments to try and make this a bit more tangible. Because I'm aware that a lot of this just ends up being numbers and figures with several zeros on the end and percentages and years that are in four years' time, five years' time, six years' time. And it just feels always just on the edge and always coming up and never actually now, which it is. So there's a Firefox plugin called Carbonalyzer, which was done by some people at the Shift Project who does some amazing research and work around this, and uh, Richard Hanna and Gautier Rosalie. And it's effectively a kind of plugin that manages it, you, everything you're viewing on Firefox and tries to work out how many megabytes it's using, what the equivalent that is in, in watts, and also in kilometers in a car and in carbon emissions. Now, obviously, this is an estimate, it's some calculations, but nonetheless, it's something that gives us at least a window into trying to measure what's good, what's bad, how bad is my consumption, what's, what are the worst parts of it, and trying to kind of visualize my usage. So for a week, I ran everything through Firefox. I did everything, all my emails, listened to Spotify, everything I watched. I did all, everything I would do on my phone through Firefox, and I kind of just kept track of everything to try and see how much I was kind of using. And again, this, this is an estimate, and measuring CO2 is incredibly difficult. But I just think it's an interesting kind of visualization. So my digital consumption footprint was you know, about 14 kilograms Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, dipped a bit on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and then nearing back up to kind of 12 kilograms on Monday. Uh, sounds like a Craig David song. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, and it's probably worth noting that um, I work four days a week, and I'm very lucky to do that. But I actually thought my digital consumption would be way higher on weekends, because you're, I don't know, watching Netflix or you're on Twitter more. But actually, I was using substantially more at work, which I guess makes sense, as my job is to sit on a laptop all day. And I've got Spotify on all the time. I'm doing emails. And it's probably worth noting as well that it was quite a sunny weekend in the UK during this time. So I was actually out socializing. and sitting in the sun. I guess if I'd uh, if been tipping it down with rain or something, maybe it would have been a bit more even. So that was the equivalent to 74.2 kilograms in a week, which is the equivalent in CO2 of flying from London to Zurich. So I tried to break down what I was using. Um, it looks like I spend too much time on Twitter, which I probably knew anyway. Um, Spotify is bad, I think we could have probably guessed. Um, Instagram email was surprisingly high, but apparently that is a known thing. Um, Netflix and Dropbox isn't a surprise. There were some other kind of, you know, Google Drive, iPlayer, conference calls, WhatsApp. But art news articles were a weird one. So I saw this article on Twitter, and I know it's clickbait, but how can you not click a link that Navy confirms UFO sightings by Blink-182 are real and should not have been released? I had to <laughs> click it. And I did, and it was quite staggering how heavy this web page was from NBC. It had videos, ad trackers, ads, loads of other clickbait news sites that kept popping up. So it was 127 grams of CO2 just opening this stupid article. And I'm old enough to remember when designing an article for a, or a website was the main driver was keeping it as light as possible. And it just seems we've bloated these things with so much cookies, trackers, analytics, spam, advertising, and unnecessary nonsense that they've just been blown out of all proportion. So I then tried to group all of the things that I'd been looking at and putting them into categories so I could kind of get more of a sense of what it was rather than just specifics. And I was kind of staggered. I thought video streaming would be by far the largest. But I, social media was 34%. And I don't feel like I even really use social media that much. I barely log into Facebook. I barely use Instagram. Um, I do use Twitter a fair bit. And I know this is just for my consumption. So I tried to kind of break it down by per minute to see if, what the offenders were, rather than it just being about my time spent on them. Um, Facebook's Twitter, Instagram, awful. But um, 
the surprising ones were things like ASOS and uh, like Arquette, Cos, all these shopping websites. They're so hungry and so heavy because they are just effectively just lots of very high-res photography, videos, GIFs, tracking you, what you're adding in your cart, things that you're doing. And just spending like five minutes on a clothing website was higher than watching something on iPlayer or Netflix. There's a few other interesting ones. Like you'll notice that Gmail and Spotify are actually look quite small on this, but they're, the reason why they're high in the end is because you end up using those a lot. Now you might dip into Instagram for 10 minutes, but emails and Spotify, well, I do anyway, just have permanently on running in the background. Uh, the Guardian, along with the news and articles, like The Guardian was surprisingly high. Trackers again, um, advertising, loading images for websites, videos. And it's not hard to see why with things like Instagram and Twitter are so high. I mean, when you look at the interface design and what we've got, it's just so image heavy, so video heavy. Everything's fine for your attention. Everything's trying to draw you in, keep you clicking, get you scrolling. And it turns out, apparently, according to some reports, the average person spends 53 minutes a day on Instagram. So if you add that up over a year with some calculations, it's about the same as flying from London to New York, London to Rome, and London to Amsterdam. And that's just Instagram, nothing else. Twitter is the same. It's a design to keep us scrolling. I remember when Twitter used to be more text-based, but now it's just become so image-heavy. And it's basically just designed to kind of keep our attention, and it's incredibly energy-intensive. So we were doing some kind of prototypes and experiments around how this could kind of look if we stripped everything back. And I'm well aware that this has to be done on the Twitter level, but I think that's actually where it should be done rather than it being on us. They should be designing their product to be lighter, to be allowing you to scroll easily and click the things that you actually want to look at and make decisions rather than just bombarding you. And I think we're going to try and like experiment with building these things out and then measuring over a course of time how much less data and energy it consumes using something in this way, which doesn't really limit the experience in any way at all. It's the exact same thing, but it's just more sustainably designed. Likewise with Instagram, there's just so much content on Instagram you didn't ask to see, you're just shown it, it's there, and you're subconsciously absorbing it. You know, you might not want to be looking at influencers or someone's gym session or healthy breakfast or holiday, but you don't have a choice about what you're looking at. It's just what the algorithm decides is at the top. You scroll, you absorb it, you look at it, and it's there. So we were kind of doing experiments with what if we use the kind of alt text that Instagram has, and then... <laughs> Maybe having a kind of like rough carbon um, signal. So maybe you get an allowance every day. So 2.7% of CO2. And then you can actually decide if you want to view someone's tedious photo of a cup of coffee on a croissant on a wooden table. And when you do, you can scroll and the little meter at the top kind of just keeps building up until you reach your limit. And that's, that's your browsing done for the day. And like I said, I know these are experiments that have to be done on... Facebook's level and Instagram's level, but I think that that's I think that's doable from them And I think people should be pushing them to think about these things more So these are just things we're experimenting with and trying to build out a bit more And finally just two things I think are really important to take away when talking about the environment um, One of them I just stole off someone's tweet. It's basically I think it's a really important thing to remember that you do not need to live a life of perfect environmental virtue to be involved in the struggle against mass extinction. And I think this is where a lot of stuff falls down, that people feel that they're not justified in being able to be involved in it because people sneer and go, oh, you went on a flight or you ate something out of plastic or you have a car. And I just think it's that kind of militantism is what needs to be weeded out. The second is an excellent book by Timothy Morton called Hyper Objects which he describes climate change and the internet as hyperobjects. So they're so massive, so overwhelming and invisible, and we're so in them that we can't even see them or like, know how big they are or understand them. They're that complex. But he made an excellent point in the book where he says that the problem is that we seem to believe that bigger or better is more real. And environmentalists, both from the left and the right, seem to have one thing in common, that incremental change is a bad thing. And it does feel like sometimes we're waiting for tech to save us or some carbon capture machine that also relies on energy to suddenly be invented and just plugged in and suck all the carbon out of the air or Elon Musk to take us all to Mars. And it really feels like this kind of ideology is on its way out and needs to be replaced with all of us making incremental change. That's it. Thanks, Thomas. You're welcome.
Sure. Um, my question is about your slide um, on uh, progress and regress. Maybe you could tell me a bit more because I might totally disagree with you there. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, about why do you think progression uh, and regression? Yeah. Um, I, I actually do agree. I think there is going to have to be an element of regression, but I just feel when you bill it as regression, it's a bit of a hard sell. So if we sell it as progress on building what we have, it might be a better way of pulling it out there rather than telling people that they're bad and need to give up things I that they do. I think hard sales are unavoidable to solve, solve this. So, I mean, you can try to convince people that we can solve the problem in a progressive way, um, but I think... Um, one flight less is still better than flying in the airplane that you showed. Yeah, that's true. I think, I don't know, it seems to be like looking at history that we're not going to learn our lesson and it's just these, ch these changes are going to be forced upon us. Um, the whole infrastructure of the internet is some interesting theories about how well it's going to be able to cope if climate does start changing. You know, if things flooding, ground heating up, all of the physical infrastructure could just start getting a bit weaker and we might just have to make these choices out of necessity rather than choice anyway. I mean, it's, I mean, just follow on from that point, I mean, there's the, the idea of degrowth as a, as a concept in terms of how we like literally stop acceleration. And I mean, we, me and Spice have talked about this quite a lot. Like, if you turn around to designers and say, you, you, should, you don't design anymore, like, your job is now, like, that, that can seem quite a reductive thing to, to a lot of people. But I don't know how you would Im look through or work through the principles of degrowth in order to then make things. I, I, it's interesting you talking about making things quieter. Have you seen the release of Lightspeed, which is the new Facebook Messenger? Yeah. And I, had to, I got a chance to interview him about it. And like, as with all Facebook people, they have a PR person sitting next to them when you get to interview them. And they were like, kind of before the, the session was at the beginning, I said, like, can we actually talk about the, the, the previous impact that Facebook had and why you're doing this. And, he, and they were like, no, we just want to talk about the product, we want to talk about this. And it was quite an interesting rhetoric shift for them. Mm -hmm. Whereas like, they could easily have said, all they said was about experience. And they just said that we're doing this for the user's experience. And I kind of said, well, can we talk a little bit about the fact that this is going to be, what are the ecological considerations that you made? And obviously he, was, he could kind of look to his PR person and was just like, I mean, we have thought about it. Like, it's not that we haven't, I mean, but we just don't really, we don't really have a statement on it yet. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and I, I just found that really interesting where it's like trying to talk about the idea of reducing and reduction, because it's always like the reduce, recycle, reduction rather mm -hmm. than other options. Um, it's just, this is more of a, a thought in how yeah. how studios who are dealing with this stuff have to could adopt some process of degrowth to understand that. But yeah, no, it's really interesting. I mean, the messenger example is an excellent one as well. Um, effectively, they've had to make messenger light because it was so unnecessarily large that it wouldn't work in third world countries on their internet connection. So they've just had to release a, a lighter one because they can't get more users in countries they're not already in because their products are just too ginormous. Yeah. So it's quite a weird... Mm -hmm. But the fact that they're not thinking about it already, I don't know, it's interesting. Designers definitely have a place where they should be fighting against things that aren't right. I mean, if I was a designer designing like an internet-connected salt shaker, for example, I would probably be thinking about what am, I, what am I contributing, what am I putting out? Is there actually a need to connect a salt shaker? No. <laughs> and I think that these, these are the questions that the designers themselves are not asking each other enough. It's all just like, we're so great, we know what we're doing, we're going to disrupt this industry, we're going to put this out there. And I think it's that, I, that mentality that needs to shift slightly. Yeah, sure. Uh, this, well, this might sound like a very basic question, but um, I'm curious why you don't just advocate for mobile internet and internet to become much more expensive. Um, I'm thinking like it would be like, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of an analogy, like, uh, I don't know, penalizing um, shower products that require you to uh, fill your bath, for example. Like, um, wouldn't it be... Is it, I mean, do, do you think it's possible for basically like uh, these multinational corporations that don't really have a connection to the, let's say, impact of their uh, data usage in any sort of like remotely local conditions, much less like national ones? Um, do you think it's like uh, 
possible to go this way, or, or should it just be managed from like the kind of tap of like data yeah, usage in Yeah, it's a really good question. I think there's definitely an element of managing it from the tap. It's going to be difficult to impose limits on people, but at the same time, the, the big companies are the ones shifting everything online. You know, the service, the subscription model and the cloud-based subscription services are the way to make money for big companies. That's why we don't own any of our music anymore. We pay for access to it every month. And why we don't own any films or television shows anymore, we just pay to access it. And throughout our lives, we're just paying and never owning anything. And that's the model that makes a lot of money. So I think it's going to be a really diff difficult shift from the consumer and certainly from big companies to kind of start trying to cap these things that they've already kind of set in place. It's a, yeah, I mean, there's so many really tricky questions. And so many things to think about, but yeah, it's a, it's a good point. I don't know the answer, unfortunately. <laughs> it's not really related to. I mean, the, no. I think the work is super interesting. It's more like a logistical. Yeah, no, work. it's a really good point. Hi. Um, the start. I guess kind of pause on from that, but I think the examples you used of Instagram and the kind of the text and, and not being allowed to see the image seem to be really kind of easy, practical solutions, right? Um, but I'm just curious, and this is also quite, a, I guess, a basic question, but I'm wondering if you've got a sense of the receptiveness of a platform like Instagram to a model like that. Have you at normally ever kind of heard from anyone? Are they open to those kinds of things? I'm curious to know if they've kind of been floated around, because it seems like a really simple, practical solution. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we, I would love to kind of build it and be able to kind of put it in front of people and do user testing for, get a range of different people to kind of switch out Instagram for that and monitor various things and see if they're using it less, if they find the experience of using Instagram actually better, if they even use less data, because they might not. It might just be a kind of hypothesis that's just totally wrong. But yeah, I'd love to find out if it, how it impacted their kind of data use and also their kind of mental well-being as well. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to try and like experiment a bit more with this and just prototype it quite crudely to get exactly that, to get more feedback from actual people. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> OK, so now we've got Chris, who is going to walk us through um, a project he's involved with called Low Tech Magazine. All right. So. Um, I started uh, Low Tech Magazine in 2007, um, following a career in high tech journalism. And um, I started it as a criticism of the vision of a high tech sustainable society. And um, what is a high, a high tech sustainable society is actually very simple. It's like we change uh, fossil fuel power plants with uh, renewable power plants, and that's it. We keep living the way we do. We keep driving uh, fast cars, for example. Um, but it's not that easy. And uh, for example, um, if you look at uh, the space and the amount of materials that renewable energy needs, it's much more than fossil fuel. So um, scientists call it the power density. So it's like 100,000 times, uh, 100 or 2,000 times more space that you need if you want to generate a similar amount of um, electricity by using solar or uh, f compared to fossil fuels. Um, secondly, of course, wind, sun are not always available. This is uh, the average output per day of a, of a wind uh, farm in, uh, in California. So, um, yeah, you need to find a way to kind of deal with that intermittency. And uh, what people say then is, okay, we just install a, a giant amount of batteries. But the problem is, of course, that you need also a lot of fossil fuels to produce the batteries, and they don't last that long, so you have to replace them. And then if you look at the, the power plants themselves, for example, uh, the windmill that we uh, build today, it's not a very sustainable product. So uh, a five megawatt uh, wind turbine has 50 tons of plastic that you cannot recycle in the blades. Um, so if we're going to build thousands and thousands of these wind turbines, we uh, create quite a, a significant uh, waste problem. 
And uh, the same goes for many of the, say, uh, the, the, the services, the products that are so-called sustainable. So you have the electric heat pumps, the electric cars. It's quite um, not only very energy intensive and resource intensive to produce, it's also extremely expensive. So if you think about like, even in a rich country, country like the Netherlands, not everybody can afford these technologies, then let alone what, what it means on a global scale, like how, what's the percentage of the global population who can afford this type of um, solutions, high-tech solutions. So basically, I'm, I'm not against renewable energies, but what we need to change, first of all, is this, so the kind of uh, products we use. And if we're talking about cars, then basically we have to downscale the car, we have to make it much smaller, much lighter, slower, uh, without technology inside, because today it's like uh, computers on wheels, basically. And um, so the car is very inefficient technology, it's, it's, and that's the good news, actually. So lots of our technology is extremely wasteful. And with cars, what you have is like we are um, transporting people in um, vehicles that weigh 1,500 kilograms. So in the end, what you're doing is you're spending more than 90% of your energy in moving the car and not moving the persons. And, and so that's extremely wasteful. And the good news is that there is a lot of, uh, say, room for, for improvement without giving up the, the technology itself. So if you design a car that weighs maybe 100 kilo, then this, this uh, balance is much more uh, interesting. And the same for a heating system, for example. What we do with heating is we, um, we, we heat the entire volume of air in a space in order to keep one or a few persons uh, comfortable. But of course, you can also do it much more local, like the Japanese do with their uh, kotatsu. So they have like an electric heater under the table, and then the whole family puts their legs under the table. And and, and the room is basically cold, so the Japanese don't really uh, heat their houses, um, and they just heat very local their bodies. And again, you can like reduce the energy use by a factor of 10 without actually giving up the, the thermal comfort that, yeah, that we, we like to have. And um, to find inspiration for a drastic uh, reduction of, of resource use, it helps a lot to look at the past. So that's what I'm doing with Low Tech Magazine. I, I go look for uh, inspiration in the past, and then I see like how can we use that knowledge and those technologies to uh, maybe even improve them and, and reintroduce them. And for example, this is heating. Uh, you have a, a food stove, you have hand stoves. You, uh, this was a tile stove, so people were gathering around a more local energy source. Um, the kotatsu also dates back to, to many centuries, and then people used um, coals or, or sinters from the fire to kind of uh, redistribute the heat. That's uh, from Afghanistan, also similar technology. Um, I'm not talking in the mic, apparently. I will try to do that now. Um, and one thing I want to talk about a little bit more before we go to the di digital technologies is uh, renewable energy. So we are um, talking about renewable energy all the time, but we're not the first ones to do that. And actually, um, before the Industrial Revolution, you had entire industries run by renewable energies. And the Netherlands is a very good example because you had a uh, very... Uh, few water resources. I mean, there's a lot of water in the Netherlands, but um, it's uh, too flat to generate energy with it. So the whole uh, Dutch economy switched to uh, wind. And this is, for instance, this is a sawmill. And um, these are a lot of mills north of Amsterdam in a region called the Zaan. They, were, they had about 1,000 windmills. It was a complete, uh, uh, say, uh, industrial uh, region. Uh, like with uh, sawing machines, with paper making, uh, polishing glass, uh, making all kinds of food. food. And um, it was entirely run by wind, and not only the industry, but also the transportation. So the Dutch, they traded a lot with uh, other countries, for example, a lot in the Baltic. Uh, the whole food, the grain came from there. So there was a lot of international uh, trade, which was also based on wind power. And um, yeah, 
the question is like, how did these people, for example, how did they deal with the intermittency of wind? Because there's not always wind. And then your sailboat or your uh, sawmill doesn't work. So what did they do? And they had a actually very simple solution. If there was no wind, there was no no factory running and there, were no, uh, there was no transportation. So they just accepted the fact that if there is no renewable energy available, you just don't use it and you, you shut down your factory, you do other work, uh, you, you have a party, whatever. Um, so you have actually accounts of windmillers that um, they play music on, their, on, a, on a quiet, calm day. They went to sit on their uh, windmill and they played the violin or whatever, and it was... Uh, yeah, we had actually more holidays in earlier times. And the same concept, I, I kind of got very fascinated by this approach to uh, renewable energy. And the same concept, you could actually use it on a lot of modern technologies. You could apply it to, again, to boats, sailboats, it would be very... Um, uh, very interesting concept to bring back. But also uh, factories, you could run them again on wind power whenever there is wind available. And it doesn't work for everything, but uh, it works for uh, very basic uh, things like cutting, boring, polishing, uh, which are still very, very important and a big part of, of energy use in industry. But you could also do it with trains, for example, and that would be a new uh, use of that uh, concept. So a freight train could just, just like a sailboat, it could move depending on the sun or the wind, solar panels, wind turbines. Um, and if there's no wind, well, it just waits. And, and freight trains also today, they, they, many times they are just waiting in, in yards to, uh, until they have enough freight and they can leave. So it's not such a big difference. Of course, you could also do it with passenger trains, but that gets a bit more complicated than you could, yeah. Could you come and give a talk in Utrecht? Well, depends on the weather. <laughs> um, but it's not impossible. It's how it, it, it happened before. And uh, it's also kind of seasonal. Wind, sun are, you know, you have lots of sun in, in summer. You have lots of wind in winter. Uh, sailboats also, sailors, they used uh, seasonal winds to get to their destination. So they were just not taking the boat whenever they felt like. It was really a planned thing. And then I started to apply this concept to my own life. And the first thing I did was to uh, get my office off the grid. So this is my home. And I put a kind of, I, yeah, it's, I rent an apartment. So I cannot, I don't really have access to the roof. So I can, cannot put like a conventional um, solar PV in, installation. And I decided to put them on the, on the window sills and balcony. And it looks like it's a, it's a very uh, small installation, and it is, but uh, because you keep it very close and you put it on the window sills, it gives a lot of extra um, opportunities to reduce uh, energy use. For instance, you could easily um, adapt the tilt of the, of the solar panel. So I did it with the Meccano uh, toys that I have for a long time. They serve for everything, basically. So what I do is every uh, like two to four times a year, I just adapt to the season. And especially in winter, that gives so much more energy. So it's really, it makes a difference. And then I switch the whole system to low voltage. So it's not, I'm not converting to 20, 220 volts. I just keep the, the voltage of the solar panel and I adapt the devices that I, I attach to it. And that also saves like 30, 40% of energy depending on the, the, the device you use. And that makes that um, actually a uh, rather small solar system can still give you all the energy you need to, uh, to do your work, to surf on the internet, and so on, if it's sunny. And um, if it's not, so I have this barometer here. Uh, I live in Barcelona, so it's quite sunny, but uh, not always. Oh. Here we are. Um, so what I do is actually what the, the, the windmillers did and the sailors did in the old times. When it's cloudy, then I adapt my work rhythm. And for example, what I discovered is that my computer uses much more energy when I'm researching on the internet than when I'm writing. So it's like 25 watts, 15 watts. So when it's like not so good weather, I better write, I don't research. 
Um, and in the worst case, when it's really three days of, of uh, shitty weather, then yeah, hey. <laughs> I reinvented the typewriter. Uh, this is not mine, but I have a, a slightly more modern one from the 70s. That's like the period when they built the, the best uh, typewriters. And um, yeah, the typewriter is actually really great. It was a discovery. I used it as a kid, but I kind of forgot how nice it was because it's not connected to the internet and you can really focus on your writing. So it's just more than, than saving energy. It also, it's very uh, healthy for your brain and your work uh, rhythm. Um, and yeah, so that's uh, how I work. And then the next step was like, so I write this uh, quite radical critique of technology, and but I'm using a website, so that's quite problematic. And I often got the comment of readers like, haha, Mr. Low Tech is telling us to be, to be critical of uh, high technology, but you're using the internet. And of course I have to, that's where people are these days, but um, still I try always to practice what I preach, and so I thought, let's build a low-tech website. And um, first short, because other speakers have already uh, talked more about it, what's, why is the energy use on the internet increasing? There's two main reasons, uh, especially when it comes to websites. First, it's like um, the increasing bit rate, so the average web page has become way fatter or heavier than it used to be, and it's a trend that keeps going. And just like in the physical world, when something is heavier, it takes more energy to transport it. So the average web, uh, like the article that Tom showed earlier, yeah, that's a very good example. Like you have to kind of transport this whole uh, website from where it is hosted on a computer to where you want to read it. And it takes a lot of energy and uh, carbon emissions. And the second reason is, yeah, we're always online. 20 years ago, or not even that long ago, we went to a library, to our desktop computer at home, at work. We dialed up into the internet, uh, we looked up something, and, and we went back offline. Those days are over. I mean, for most people, not, not for me, because I don't have one of these uh, addiction machines. But uh, these two factors together make, of course, like you have increasing bit rates, you have people are more and more online, often using multiple devices at the same time, so it could be worse even than this. And um, these two um, issues we wanted to address with the new website, so I, I will show the team later, I didn't do this alone. And um, so we went, the, the Low Tech Magazine is about you want to find the solution of a problem, then go look back in the, in the past. And with internet, with websites, I was surprised that the same truth holds, actually. So you want to have a solution for the energy use of the internet, and go back to the 1990s and see how people built websites. And what they did those times, they built static web websites. So it's like a file on your computer, it's always there, you just access it, you open it, and that's it. Today we have uh, dynamic websites, which means that they are generated every time uh, someone visits them. So, so in order to present the most recent updates, the likes, the comments, and everything. But that means that it only, uh, it doesn't really exist ever at web websites. It always needs to be generated and that requires a lot of uh, uh, computer power and thus energy use, carbon emissions. So um, we went back to the static web page and then we had to deal with the images because it's a very uh, image rich uh, website and it would have been easy to just make it low tech by getting rid of all the images, but that would not have been a good idea. So we went back to an old uh, compression technique called dithering, which you see here. Um, you strip the image of the colors, you, it's a very low resolution, all these little crosses. And for most images it really works well. So it's more than, I mean, it also became a very, like a design element, but it's, every image is now like 10 to 15 times less uh, data intensive than, than it was before. Um, and if you kind of, downscale, downsize your website, uh, s that it, it uses very little energy, the you have the opportunity to host it yourself. And so that's what, what we did. 
this is standing in my living room. There you see the server. It's like a kind of mobile phone type of uh, computer. It consumes 1 to 1.5 watts, so the whole website uh, runs on that. It has very high traffic also, and we, the, the most, um, like we, the maximum resources we used from the server was 30%. So even on, on a Hacker News first, first uh, homepage of Hacker News, it, it really takes it without any problems. I never had a website that ran with so little problem than this one. And so it's plugged into the solar controller, because if you host your own website, you can, of course, decide how to power it. And then this is a solar panel, which is uh, at the balcony, right uh, next to the, where the server is. It's quite a big one, because um, I only have, uh, so it's like shaded, you don't see it, but there's like a roof over the balcony, so it only receives sun from like one in the afternoon. Uh, but that's why I, I, I made it uh, a bit bigger. But it has an extremely... Um, oh. Yeah, I don't have a picture of the battery. It has a very small battery. And that harks back to what I said before. Like, um, you could easily uh, make a website, solar-powered website, that's always online. But um, when you design an off-grid system, off-grid uh, power system, there's always, uh, you need to find a balance between um, reliability and between sustainability, space, and costs. And if you want to keep it always online, I would have to put a greater, a bigger solar panel, but especially much more batteries, and I would need more space, and it would become totally un unsustainable with this amount of battery. So, yeah, that's a bit uh, the kind of theoretic theoretical uh, argument for this. And, of course, if your website is not always online, it's a bit uh, problematic for, say, the, the, the visitors. So we, had, we designed several clues, like you, you see this battery meter here, it's now at 50%. I cannot show the live website because it's raining in Barcelona and it's down. <laughs> um, so um, here we are at 50%, and then this, uh, well, it fits full, it's a yellow website. If it's almost a uh, dead battery, it's a, it's a blue background. People complain. I mean, some people love it, some people hate it. But we really wanted to show the infrastructure of the website. We wanted to show that there is, uh, it's not in the cloud, like you, Tom said, it's on someone else's computer, which is standing in my living room. Um, and to, to show people like, yeah, this is the reality. So you have a website and this is its energy source, it's the battery. Uh, so yeah, we had the, we needed a minimal battery. Okay, we needed a minimal battery to get it through the night because otherwise there's so many readers in the United States, so they would never be able to see it through, during the day. So, but it's really made to get to go through the night. But once it gets cloudy, it's over. And so that's why we also put a weather report on. Um, on the website, and it pulls in a kind of a weather forecast of, a, of another website. And then you see, when you see this, for instance, you know, okay, I can go to Low Tech Magazine, no problem. If you would see it now, if it comes online, yeah, you see cloudy, cloudy, cloudy rain, and then, you know, it's uh, better um, to come back at another time. Also, interesting is that when the site is down, you just get a common Google page that says this website is not available. Many people told us, yeah, but you have to put up like some message like come back later. But to do that, you actually need a second server. <laughs> and it, you would destroy the whole concept. So no, it's just gone. And um, interestingly, Google uh, punishes us for this. So if you get uh, in your email, I send you the link and you try to click on it, Google says this is not a reliable website. Um, so that might be problematic for uh, Google rankings, but let's see. And then ultimately, we decided to make a printed version of the website, uh, just in case the website is down, you can still read it on, uh, well, on paper, you know. And uh, the great thing about a paper version of a website, which, I mean, the, all the content is there, but you can read it whatever, no matter what weather it is. Um, you don't even need uh, electric power grid, internet, uh, civilization. Uh, you can always access um, the website like that. And yeah, it's kind of like a middle finger to the internet. 
and to an answer to all these critics that says, haha, you're using the internet. Well, not anymore, buy my book. And that also gives me the uh, opportunity to, I took all the advertisements of the website because it's not compatible with a low energy website from the moment you put ad, ad, advertisements, yeah, it's all, uh, you cannot host it yourself anymore. It becomes too resource intensive. You need to craft cookie warnings and all that stuff. So we just um, got rid of all the tracking. So there's no ads, there's no tracking, not even the statistics, because if you host your own website, you have access to the, the, the data of the server itself. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Thank, thanks to all of them who made this possible. And that's it. Thank you. Hi. Um, so this uh, is, doesn't really actually have to do with your the, the the website, which I think is a super admirable project. I just wanted to challenge a bit the narrative you gave of the Dutch uh, renewable energy history. I mean, uh, it's not like a specialty of mine. I've, I've read um, uh, like Jason Moore's Capitalism and the Web of Life, and he talks about how the Netherlands um, kind of exploitation of peat was one of the first. Uh, like mass uh, exhaustion of a non-renewable resource, and not to mention the fact that like this trade with the Baltic also meant like mass deforestation uh, there or like in southern Norway, and like uh -huh. ships are obviously not you know built on renewable resource. So, yeah, I just wanted to kind of question a bit like the assumption that you know in the Netherlands when the windmills weren't running, like people were just kind of uh, not using a their footprints in a way. You yeah, know what I mean? that's a good point. Um, so actually, to be correct, I need to say that the whole mechanical energy was produced by wind. And um, actually, it's one of the main problems today why we don't really have a good idea of what renewable energy can do and not do, is that um, you need mechanical energy to run machines and everything, but you also need thermal energy to, uh, for example, to make bricks, to, uh, yeah, to heat a building, to cook, uh, but also a lot of industrial processes need, um, need heat. And, and with wind power, you, it's, I mean, actually you can, you have heat generating windmills, that's another article on the site. But it's difficult to, um, yeah, say, cook with an old-fashioned windmill because it just generates mechanical energy. So the, the Dutch golden age was based on first wind power and two, peat. And peat um, is like something between a renewable energy source and a fossil fuel because it takes like 3,000 years to renew. Uh, it also produces a lot of uh, carbon emissions. And actually, so on one side for the mechanical energy, the, the Netherlands were like a, like a dream image of a renewable energy society. But if you look at the thermal energy, it was a disaster. So they kind of almost destroyed their country. So uh, lots of land that was f before one on the sea. So they kind of uh, made their, their land bigger, but then they lost it again because they dug out all the peat. And entire villages disappeared in the waves. Um, and, and yeah, that's a bit uh, the, the problem of, of those days. But there is good news in the sense that we have new technology for thermal energy. So you can now, since we can make mirrors and glass, we can concentrate the uh, solar energy and you could reach like temperatures of three, four, five thousand degrees if you just focus the sunlight through mirrors. And then you can do all the thermal processes that, that you could that you could need, like even people, uh, scientists demonstrated making uh, solar panels using focused solar heat. So you have to adapt your, your machines, but still you could do anything uh, that requires high temperature with uh, focused solar light. And yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's it. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to apologize because I think I'm probably just taking up space more than asking a question, but I wanted to return to the question that Tobias had for me earlier, which was about what ecofeminism, what the sort of theories I was talking about, the impact that it could have on the real world, and I think your presentation has just done that. This sort of 
almost hippie-ish idea that we need to live in symbiosis with nature, well, you've demonstrated that perfectly by saying, yeah, my website's not live because the sun's not out. And I think that's, yep. that's just a perfect illustration of what an eco-feminist approach to design and living actually means. Oh, great. That's that. a so batch thank you of for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, if we, I think it's very important to, to take that seriously, to, because if we would at, accept that renewable energy is not always available, we can forget the whole energy storage infrastructure. I mean, not totally. You can have some, like I also have a limited battery and like hospitals or food production can, can have more energy storage. But it saves so much resources if we don't have to build this whole infrastructure of transmission lines to kind of transport energy from Spain to the Netherlands and the other way around and batteries and it makes it completely unrealistic. And, and if you do it like that, it, it's much more, uh, yeah, hey, we could do that. Because if you now start calculating also uh, like, okay, what's all these visions? And then you calculate how much energy it takes, like, okay, we cannot do this, guys. Come on, be, be serious. Don't stop telling fairy tales, and and in this way it could, it could work. And maintaining a kind of modern lifestyle, you still have trains, cars, websites, but not always. I mean, I, I haven't read the the low tech book, so I'm, I maybe you can talk more to this. But one of the issues with doing this kind of sustainable lifestyle is having the tools and knowledge to be able to do it. Um, and it's making sh how you try and disseminate that to people through other forms of education beyond just the website and the, and the articles. I think that can often be a barrier for people to kind of go like, oh, I have no idea how a battery works. So, yeah. or how solar power can be hooked up to my flat. And also there is the issue of things like if you are in a rented apartment, you're not allowed to do certain things, especially in the UK, you can't kind of fix your own energy, energy sources. Um, so you have these other kind of policy issues to wrangle as much as you do technological and I wasn't sure if you want to speak more to how you're engaging people to, to be able to do it themselves beyond just visiting the website. Yeah, so I try to write with, from the experience of indeed a very kind of restricted position like I live in a very small apartment and I rent it so I, I have limited possibilities. So I try to do everything I can so I practice what I preach very like quite radically. But it's more, it's really a research position. It's not so much that I'm saying like everybody needs to do this because uh, what uh, was said before, like we have very limited, um, yeah, we cannot do so much. I mean, for instance, I stopped flying also when I, when I started the blog, so I'm doing everything by train. But then uh, that made me realize that actually the European railway network is disintegrating and it gets more difficult every year to, to do my trips by train. So then I could write an article about what's going wrong with the train network. But we cannot, I mean, I'm trying to show what we can do, but especially also what we cannot do. And that, for instance, is these train articles like, OK, you say we have to stop flying and we have to take the train, but then I have to pay three, four times more and it takes me much longer and you get rid of all the night trains and that's and, and you keep subsidizing the airplane. So the system needs to change so that people can make the right decisions. And also we cannot research each one of us what's like, OK, you want to buy toothpaste. What's the most sustainable toothpaste? Well, good luck. It's going to take you a few days. And if you have to research everything, it's, it's someone else on a higher level should do that. Like, okay, this uh, toothpaste is bad for the environment. Yeah, maybe bad example, but it's not allowed to be sold. Um, but yeah, we cannot do it ourselves. It's, uh, we really need to get politicians involved because they at least theoretically have the power to, to change the laws and to kind of rein in the, the companies. That's, the problem is they're basically in in their pocket. So, so yeah. But I'm, the last discovery I made was the mist shower. I'm actually traveling with it. So you you, it's kind of a, a, a student in Antwerpen designed it, and it's a, it has all these kind of nozzles, and you just plug it into your shower. So you disconnect your shower head, you plug it in, and you kind of install it with some duct tape and iron wires and. With two liters of water, you have like a super uh, comfortable, uh, relaxing shower. 
And there again, you see, uh, it was a surprise for me because I was like, oh, what am I going to do with the shower? But now I know. Because if you look at the, the energy use of a water boiler, yeah, I can never power that in my apartment. But now with this mist shower, I'm thinking like, okay, I can use a very much smaller boiler. 10 liters would be enough. I could maybe even warm it in the sun because I have good solar exposure. And then we can also take the shower offline, so off grid and off pipe maybe. Because you could almost mop up the <laughs> two liters of water. <laughs> So you could shower wherever you want. <laughs> it's a pity I didn't bring it now. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that will be the next uh, article. But I keep uh, being surprised of what is possible if you think in a low-tech way. Like, um, I had never expected to shower, uh, nor the website. It just uh, keeps appearing like, whoa. Sorry. Um, my question was kind of, Natalie kind of asked part of my question to do with, Natalie, you mentioned that in, for example, the UK, like installing what you have in your house might not be allowed because of restrictions and legislation that's in place. So it seems like these are issues that could be fixed by, for example, like local councils adopting these models, right? Like they could really, really help in these things. Yeah. And I'm wondering, again, almost in the same way that I asked Tom, like, have you been aware of any receptiveness to this by councils in Barcelona? Are they aware that you're doing this, or is there, I'm just curious to know if anyone's picked up on it, or if it, how can you implement it? Yeah, um, I have limited time, obviously, so what I try to do is write, and then I know that it will reach a lot of people, and then I do talks, and then it's kind of other public, but I, can, I'm, I cannot really do, kind of go to the council yeah. and, and say, can we... Uh, yeah, could you change the law? I'm not good at that, no. and I don't have time for it, but I think other people do, maybe inspired by this. Um, but yeah, that's no, I, I fail on that. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but for instance, if you, it also, very little, because I am, my, my PowerPoint is gone, but I don't know if you saw it on the, my balcony, I have like this kind of uh, metal bar that many apartments in Barcelona have. It's actually to uh, avoid that the plants are falling down and kill someone. But simply having that for, made it so much easier to install the solar panels there, because otherwise it's quite, yeah, you need to be sure they don't fly off the, off the windowsill. That would be quite disastrous. So, uh, but having simply this metal bar made it so easy for me. And then I check when I am in other people's house, like, yeah, here. <laughs> It has like a window sill like this, and it goes a bit down. And so, also architectural. Um, I mean, architects have done a really bad job the last <laughs> decades. <laughs> also, for instance, if you look at the tumble dryer in in Spain, for example, you have um, a special room for that, which is uh, part in your house, but then one wall is open to the outside. It cannot rain inside, but there's like a constant uh, air coming in. And that's just the space to hang the clothes to dry. And these are all architectural, uh, another, uh, the root cellar, like uh, to, say, to store food, older houses at the basement where to store the food. It was always cool there. And yeah, uh, modern houses have no basement anymore. So architects are also, um, but there's a lot of work because if you look at uh, like uh, here in the Netherlands, for instance, how people are, um, obliged to, to insulate their houses and all these kind of things. Yeah, it's not really compatible with, with, with a low-tech approach. Mm. So it's all about, we are now making houses built around expensive heat pumps and stuff like that, uh, energy-efficient refrigerators, but not the cellar. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the regulations now are completely uh, opposite of, of this approach. So, there, uh, I mean, it could be possible to convince a council, maybe, but it will take uh, quite some effort, I think. Mm -hmm. But I noticed that the kind of 10 years ago, people laughed at me, and that, I mean, that doesn't happen so often yeah. anymore. All right. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you. Oh, we've got like in maybe 10 minutes. Ah, okay. But then we're good. Thanks.
Um, yes, thank you so much, Chris. I saw Chris speak at I Am Weekend this year. Yeah, yeah it was this year. Um, and um, everyone in the audience was just absolutely mesmerized. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I still am. So thank you so much for um, sharing, sharing that. Um, OK, so to go back to this workshop, um, I'm just going to recap on the brief that we gave the participants yesterday. So, um, you know, like I said, there was 25 participants. Um, they had to answer this brief, which was design a personal intelligent assistant that meets an ecological need and promotes environmentally conscious design. The participants had the chance to listen to those talks um, that we have all just heard from Taryn, Tom, and Chris. Um, and we had some really interesting um, kind of conversations and responses from the participants that we'll probably get into a little bit later. Um, they were quite surprising. Um, and then we sort of walked them through a series of activities during the day um, to help them achieve the brief. Um, also to help, we developed what we called the eco-feminist design standards. So these standards are actually an adoption from a framework called Designing Feminist Chatbots by researcher Josie Young. Uh, Josie created those prompts as a guide for um, those that are designing chatbots and other artificial intelligence systems. Um, so we sort of took that framework, the foundation of that framework, and reworked it so we could use it almost as, as like a checklist. Um, um, when, uh, when we're designing um, the projects that we're making and seeing if we are meeting an environmental need. So I'm just going to walk through them really quickly because we don't have a huge amount of like, uh, time left. Uh, but the first standard is called users. So this is sort of centered around the idea of the universal user. You know, um, it's become very popular within design. Um, it's uh, sort of means designing for everyone, uh, which sounds brilliant, but it can also mean that people with specific needs, especially those that are not currently well served and um, uh, are not really considered by designers or are missed out in the design process. So we often make, we also often make assumptions um, about user groups. So through research um, about and direct contact with uh, them is incredibly important. We just really wanted to stress um, to anyone that comes to our workshops that sort of minimizing that distance between you as a designer and the user groups that you're designing for is, is, is incredibly important and can vastly induce, uh, reduce the success of your design. Um, purpose, so technologies are of course built for uh, many different reasons and you uh, can have uh, many possible uh, benefits or harmful consequences for people and also the planet as well as we've seen today. This toolkit is about encouraging you to design technologies that improve rather than damage social, environmental, and economic outcomes. Uh, team bias, we all come from different places and experiences that have shaped our uh, thinking and perspectives. And we find uh, we tend to unconscious unconsciously embed these practices within the, the things that we make. The rise the risk of not reflecting on this is that you may reinforce negative stereotypes about your user group, um, about particular user groups, um, which could be quite harmful to your users. Um, these are some more ecological focused standards. So user-centered design has focused on a user who is centered as a consumer. This can encourage excessive consumption and waste. Humans have human needs have been equated with market needs at the expense of planetary well-being. One of the main drivers of increasing energy consumption is our always online culture driven by a wanting and desire for content online. So we were sort of asking the participants, you know, does your, in, does your design encourage people to spend excessive amount of time of uh, excessive amounts of time online? Is there any way that you can encourage people to spend less amount of time online? Um, design and representation, of course, design uh, decisions around materials, energy usage, and representation can have big environmental impacts. So, you know, how could you replace visual elements with maybe other forms of interfaces that aren't as um, energy draining? Uh, have you considered if your design can minimize the consumption of large, high quality images, videos, etc., to reduce energy use? Um, invisible architecture. Building connected devices takes place within a complex physical ecosystem of data and service, data service, internet cables, and exploited human labor. Um, is there any way that you could 
minimize the use of uh, technologies such as AI or, you know, are you aware of unemployed or exploitative labor within the ecosystem that you are designing on? What, so conversation design is also a little bit of a curveball, but we wanted to sort of challenge participants, you know, if conversation is the primary interface between the human and your design, the dialogue needs to be carefully crafted. This is how the user will decide whether the design is effective. So we're really just trying to challenge uh, people to see if they can think, you know, beyond the idea of an app or a uh, plugin, you know, is there other ways that your user can interact with your idea? I just kind of want to highlight this point that's made in the purpose standard, which is that this toolkit is about encouraging you to design technologies that improve rather than damage social, environmental, and economic outcomes. So it's really just about referring to this checklist, being critical of it, of, of it as well, of course, um, as you're going through the design processes you would do. So we are now going to go through the out puts of yesterday's uh, workshop. Um, yeah, they were very interesting, um, especially the, uh, for the fact that they built these in like three, two hours, I think, something like that towards the end. It was very crazy, very rapid, but um, some really, really brilliant, um, really brilliant outcomes. The first project we're going to show is a app. I think, called ASCII, uh, a low data uh, use wayfinding interface. So we have, oh, okay, here's the description. Users can ask ASCII for directions and get routes um, in ASCII yeah. format text, yeah. Uh, at, the end, the, at the end of the journey, the user would be more informed about how much energy they saved using um, this sort of really low data use ASCII instead of uh, Google Maps. Yo, ASCII. I need to get to the Lange Nieuwestraat 4. What is the quickest route? try and run through these fairly quickly. Next up we have Dyslexa, um, an internet connected dynamo. Dyslexa allows users to, gener to generate uh, their own electricity by s <laughs> spinning a dynamo on the device or using it on their bike. So we just kind of got introduced to the idea of a dynamo yesterday, but I'm sure people in the traction know exactly what that is, but it's a device that you fit on a bike and it generates electricity from spinning a wheel. Uh, Dialexa also monitors and limits the user data consumption and changes color when they're nearing their limit. Hey, Dialexa. Hi, how can I help you? Can I remind you, you have almost reached your data limit for today. I'd like to order some apples for tomorrow. Apples found, would you like them in good quality, ecological or cheap? Can you get me the cheapest one? Are you sure? The reviews on these apples are below two stars. 
Can you find me the cheapest apples with a rating above 3.5? Placing order on red delicious apples for tomorrow. Is that good? Yes, Alexa. Thank you. My online data is running low. Would you like to turn on local data mode? Yeah, all right. Okay, next up we have Eden, a conversational, uh, which are conversational tutorials to get people more into gardening. Eden gives users personalized gardening and growing tips through voice rather than relying on YouTube tutorials. The idea is to give users enough confidence to grow and garden so they won't need the app anymore. Hi there, welcome. What will we be doing today? What will we be adding today? What kind? Seeds, cuttings, or a plant? All right then, you can put them in a glass of water. Make sure the bottom leaves don't touch the water. If they do, just cut them off. Now put the glass near natural lighting. A windowsill will do the job. They should be in water for about two weeks or until their roots are established. That will happen when they are about three to six centimeters long. Don't worry about it too much. I'll remind you every other day. No problem. No problem. Is there anything else I can help you with? No, thank you. All right, then. Don't forget to water your parsley soon. Call me when you need me. Till next time, goodbye. Hi there. Welcome. What will we do? <laughs> uh, yeah, some uh, interesting editing techniques there. I think um, there was a... <laughs> I think half of the dialogue was on, like, the right channel or something, so, okay. We'll put them online. Lock shop, um, maybe we won't put them online, maybe that's not, not, what, we should, not, what, should, we, not what we should be doing. Um, offline map that routes to buy shopping locally. Users can tell lock shop what they need to buy and lock shop will send them offline maps to their phones. Uh, it directs them to wherever to, it directs them to them where they can pick up their shopping from local independent stores rather than the supermarkets. Meet Lockshop. Lockshop is a new app promoting local shopping. Ask it to add your groceries and for advice on conscious shopping. When you're heading out, Lockshop will plan a route and tell you which local small stores have your ingredients at a reasonable price. Why? We are trying to encourage young people here in Utrecht to shop without enabling the supermarket monopoly. As well as help them save money, be more conscious and eco-friendly. And support your local community. Ask Lock Shop anything to start. Lock Shop, can you add oranges to my list? Oranges are out of season right now. May I suggest you use an alternative, like apples. Design standards. We have used the design standards for users and consumption. In the case of users, our target group are young people who live in Utrecht. Most of them are renting a living space and therefore do not have a lot of disposable income. Most of them are, however, interested in improving their environmental footprint, but do not have the time or previously mentioned disposable income. With Lockshop, they can save money and help reduce the environmental footprint by not supporting large supermarket chains. As for consumption, Lockshop does not encourage people to spend a lot of time online, as you can simply ask it to add an item to your shopping list, at, at which point it will add it to your list or give you a suggestion. Vision shows that people do not have to go online to see if a certain shop has the required item. <laughs> okay, next up we have Purim, a personal assistant to help you shop smarter. Purim is a personal voice assistant that lives on your phone. It gives you healthier and more sustainable recipes and shopping tips and aims to inform and educate users without shaming them. 
Hey Peter, what's for dinner? What's your budget? Uh, so it's the end of the month, so make it cheap, I think 5 euros. What are you going to get? Uh, I feel like fried chicken. I have some suggestions for chicken on sale. Look at these recipes I found for you. There are some healthy ones as well. Hmm, great. I like the couscous chicken better than the fried one. You still have the tomatoes for that recipe at home. Okay, great. Um, which chicken would you recommend? This organic local chicken is now cheaper than the non-organic one. Sounds great. Thanks, Piron. Next up we have Reflecting Robin, which is a personal assistant in your mirror. Reflecting Robin helps you make more conscious environmental decisions using the mirror as a time of self-reflection. It converses with the user and judges their mood. It gently encourages them to spend less time online, going outside to see the weather or consuming digital content socially rather than on their own. Hi, do you want to talk? Oh, uh, yeah, fine. How are you feeling today? Good, bad <laughs> or in between? A little bit in between, I guess. And what are you doing today? Oh, I'm a bit tired. I think I'm, uh, I'm going to stay home today. Watch some movies, I guess. What are you planning to watch? Um, I think the new clips from uh, Gorillaz, the new album, I guess. Oh, nice. I see you listened to this before. Have you thought of downloading it? Downloading the songs is better for the environment than streaming. Okay, I will take it in consideration. Thanks for the tip, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the most realistic response as well. It's <laughs> brilliant. I uh, love the built-in skepticism. Okay. And, and exciting. Um, I, yeah, I think that the, the point for, for, for us was to, to do this as a, to, to support you in doing this as an experiment with a view to developing further stuff, to see it even succeed at that scale in sort of two to three hours with people who are maybe fresh to that type of working was really, was really good, yeah. I thought that, that, that was a phenomenally animated and progressive sort of um, vibe in the room, yeah. Yeah, the one with the blonde hair in the end of the video is like, I can't stream Netflix anymore. <laughs> like, Netflix is bad. Um, basically, because obviously uh, there is a process of unbutton. Um, like, when you work through a process yourself or you get new information, you have to kind of, it's it can be quite difficult unless you're given like tools to do it. So it was really nice actually seeing the framework of the, cause we didn't see the introductory thing. Mm -hmm. um, and seeing the framework being not this kind of like design thinking, solve solution thing, but actually unbuttoning all of those intersections that exist. I think that kind of came up a little bit. Um, we're, we're quite kind of it, you can see the starting of different thinking around it, which is really nice. Um, I really like the idea of the kind of there's a level of comedy, and this is why I quite like the ASCII one because it was just a bit funny and weird. Because obviously we can really, I, I could really read a critique into that and be like, but the thing is like if you're unfamiliar to the area and you don't know the area very well, then maybe that's not the best choice, but it is an option and it's a way of thinking rather than it being like a solution, which is really nice. Um, and Tobias made a good point about the, the last one in particular being quite deliberately provocative and quite like, rather than being like, oh, well, maybe you should try this different product. It was like, maybe you should just do something different. How do you feel about that? Um, it was quite nice seeing them work through that. And actually that's, the workshop was almost the more important part of this whole, these two days was getting, the next, uh, those designers who are in that context to then be able to hopefully embed it within the, their next practice exercise. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah, I guess that's the sort of intention with any of these really fast-paced workshops is really just to start thinking about those standards and questions and because um, it's, it's such like a, f it feels like such a fresh introduction to um, some students. So uh, I guess it's just about embedding them really fastly and the outcomes I suppose don't matter too much. It's, yeah, it's definitely about that process. Um, 
to the workshop host, do you think there's any projects in particular that stand out, or do you have any 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 out input on the outputs? Uh, I guess to pick up where Natalie just left off, the last project in particular was really interesting because when we were kind of brainstorming for the workshop, um, we came across this video which we're still trying to figure out if it's real or not, but it's someone asking Alexa whether um, they, I mean she, whether she's a vegan and she quite explicitly um, expresses an opinion on that, which is really interesting because uh, generally speaking, when you are, I mean, we've done this with previous workshops, when you ask Alexa whether she's a feminist, she gives a completely non-committal response. The same with Siri. I think Siri just does the usual all lives matter response. You know, I believe in, in the equality of, of all people. Um, so to have one that sort of seems to express some kind of empathy in the way that it speaks to its user, but also gives you a nudge. I mean, it's, it's a bit of a different consideration like, a like something that's more politically and socially ingrained like feminism, but even so to say, hey, maybe you should consider this approach instead um, as a suggestion rather than something that's just Im implicit in the way that the app is behaving is really interesting, I think. Yeah, I thought all the projects were really great and the students were very um, surprised about the internet using energy and how much energy it uses, um, which is really interesting. They all seem super engaged on that subject matter, and I think it it's like kind of in one, enabled them all to kind of think about what they could do more and how they could change things. Um, I think the ASCII one is super interesting. I, I really like that as a kind of lo-fi way, and it goes back to what Chris was saying about looking to the past. So I guess if you look at that, I mean, it's not a million miles off just stopping someone in the street and asking them where something is. Back before the internet, and they would have said, you know, up, left, second, right. But it's just quite a nice way to kind of use uh, text on devices that everyone carries around. It was the other interesting thing I found was a lot of the projects tended to, they were magnetically drawn towards phones, which is super interesting because yeah. the brief was about personal intelligent assistants and voices and all the things that voice could live in. But I think this generation of the first have like, been born online effectively and they really, I think they were all just got drawn immediately to the fact that they would obviously be on a phone and why wouldn't it be on the phone? because the phone is the thing that I always talk to and I always have. So I thought that was a really, I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, that's a good point. It was, it was sort of challenging, I suppose, to draw them away from that sort of existing interface. Yeah. Um, but it worked in the end, I think, for some of the projects. Oh, yeah. Um, it's interesting, um, I, I'm a curator at a, a, museum, a design museum in London um, and I've been collecting, I've got three examples now in the permanent collection of essentially failed eyewear technologies <laughs> um, and we've just actually acquired a pair of glasses by IRL Labs which blocks the screens, so when you put them on it blocks um, certain types of LED screens, so it's kind of like a, a version of They Live. But we were doing like, a lot of research into why they fail because like, Snapchat basically the first iteration um, Failed with like 400, I think it's like, four, it's like $400,000 in unsold and unassembled stock um, because people just weren't, didn't like the idea of having camera in the face. And they were like, Did you actually speak to any young people about like what, just what they use? And they were like, Well, we did, but we, we had these champions and these people who were like influencers. And they, have, they obviously, the, the, in their mind, it's like, I've been given this new fun toy, I'll play with it. But actually, the majority of their friends were just like, It's kind of weird. Uh, in the second iteration, they reduced, they reduced the light on it because apparently that was really distracting, but from a surveillance point of view, it's completely different. Um, but it's interesting you showing all of those devices that are out there because I, I, I wonder actually how many of them, younger people have them, because I think the people who do have them are the ones who are already early tech adopters and think it's really, really great, um, and aren't the ones who maybe are thinking about the ecological side. But I was going to ask a question. Did you have any like real pushback from students who were like, who, it's not that they, they didn't believe it, but more just... Um, I don't know, we're we'll dismissive. I don't know. I'm interested to see people who perhaps didn't kind of go, oh my God, yeah, you call it like, we should reduce Netflix. And whether there's anyone who did want to be like, oh, how can we have both or how can we make sure that that coexists? Uh, well, we did have one guy. We do a thing at the feminist internet where we check in before we get started for the day and we express how we're feeling about what we're about to engage with. Uh, one guy who spoke up and said that the word he used was sceptical and um, kind of questioned your 
the measuring that you did um, in terms of your carbon footprint through your internet usage, and was, you know, I really don't think it's anywhere near as, as heavy as that. Um, but certainly, I, I think he was definitely one of the most engaged participants by the end of the day, like really came around to, to yeah, those, those conversations. And, um, but I think, y universally speaking, everyone was so shocked um, by the by the footprint, you know, much more than we were expecting, uh, and that seemed to be, I think, the predominant focus for nearly every group was really the the heaviness of of app usage, which is maybe why why phones became such a big focus overall. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, I just remember one person's reaction who just put their hand up and just said. If this is true, then why have I never heard about it? And it was, <laughs> <laughs> I was just genuinely angry that this was the first time that I'd been made aware of that the, the internet uses energy. <laughs> but yeah, they were, they were all, I think someone else said as well that they would really love, like, they were asking if there was a resource available where you could mm -hmm. um, compare different things because they wanted to see the stuff they use on their phone and start like weighing up which ones were the worst. They could stop using them less or maybe replace them with other alternatives, which is a really great point, and as far as I'm aware, doesn't exist. I don't know if anyone else knows of another kind of service that does it, but I think that's almost certainly something that should exist, so people can start actually making choices and cutting things out. Yeah, I think that's why um, there was like a certain amount of projects that sort of gravitated to that um, information, you know, kind of sharing approach. Um, it seems quite natural as well if you're kind of dealing with a conversational interface as part of the brief that I guess like a natural response to that was, is about making the device just quite informative, and that does work. It does work in some of the in some of the scenarios, and I think they did get quite playful in the way that um, that sort of uh, knowledge and intel is transferred. Yeah. Oh, fine. Um, <laughs> okay. Do we have any questions for the audience to round things off? We have about five minutes. Some mic coming. Um. My question is about remote versus um, local, and it's a bit about what Chris does with his server. Um, and I can imagine in some cases um, doing things more locally is better for the environment, but also in some other cases um, doing things remote uh, is the more efficient way to go, uh, whether it's about storage of things or production of things. I'm curious what your comments or knowledge is about that, any of the speakers in the panel. I think Chris is probably the best. Yeah, um, good question. Uh, I think going more local is a very important part of, of kind of trying to live within the limits of, of what the planet uh, uh, kind of obliges us to do. Um, the internet is a bit kind of, yeah, it's, it's almost by definition planetary thing or at least like not in the rich world because most of the websites we make and the apps we make in the half of the world you cannot even access them because the internet connections are too slow and the computers too old um, but um, I don't know it, it can be the, the problem is not that we kind of uh, have global trade for example I don't think the problem is for example in, in the context of food that uh, we import um, I don't know bananas the problem is that we import everything also that food we can grow in our own country we also import it because it's cheaper to get it from uh, yeah Vietnam or China New Zealand wherever it comes from and that's of course foolish and you can never kind of come to a solution if, if you don't address that waste, inherent waste in the system. And, and not just that, but also a product like an iPhone, it was recently in the news, uh, how often these, these parts are traveling, uh, thousands of kilometers, and then it, it gets, something gets built on it, and then it goes back, and then another one builds something on top of that, and it goes back again, thousand kilometers, and that's completely, um, crazy system that that should um, be addressed. But at the same time, I always feel a bit uncomfortable because it's also what Trump is doing in, in a way, like he's super localist in that sense. And of course, I like many people here, I guess I'm very much offended by this guy. But when it's about that, I'm like, yeah, well, 
um, actually globalization is something that uh, is at the heart of not only the, the, the environmental destruction, but also migration, for instance. So it's basically what kind of binds the left and the right is this whole um, globalization of, of production and power also. So global corporations that basically took over the power because they're global and they can kind of, um, uh, how you say, uh, um, Nederlanders in the zaal, chanteren. Uh, Blackmail the, the countries, like, okay, uh, who offers the, the lowest tax regime, we, we go produce there. So, yeah, I think it's a very um, important part of the solution is to become more global, local, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, there's something interesting about um, the power that's required to do things. So, um, when we've got a colleague of ours who we also commissioned for the Impact Fest in 2017 called Wes Goatley, who gets asked all the time, is Instagram, I mentioned earlier, but is Instagram listening to you? And he says, well, it is, but not in the way you think, because if it was doing it live on your device, your phone would be 10 times larger than it was because the power and the protein that's required to do that, you couldn't do locally on your phone. So in, what you locally are able to do, maybe Tobias can comment more on this because he does this um, it's, it's to some degree, um, is the idea of actually what you're able to do on the devices that we have. And if you want to do things more locally, we'd have to have higher power on those local devices. Um, things like machine learning or AI just wouldn't be possible unless, I don't know, you're, which is why people outsource and, and train on, on other places. And there's quite an interesting initiative that's happening um, a lot within museum collections is the idea of sharing data sets so that you don't have to retrain and you don't have to create new ones. You can share them, which reduces the amount of power that's required to, to do that. Um, but I know that there are literal computation problems with there being locally connected things, which means that we just have to either do less or find cooperative ways of, of training in uh, community aspects. So, I don't know, a community server in that way. How do computers work? Um, not well. <laughs> um, yeah, you'd need more computer if you wanted to do what you do now locally. But you know this, you're making an archive of enormous amounts of films upstairs. You know how much computation it requires. It's kind of difficult. I want to, just very quickly, while I have the microphone, something struck me listening to this way that we frame arguments like locally and um, globally in regards to the question asked earlier about couldn't essentially the internet be levied. And the precedent that came into my head was um, cigarettes. The framing of smoking as a public health issue opened up the ability of governments to increase tax on them exponentially to make them essentially unaffordable so there were no n more new smokers. Uh, certainly that's the case in the UK. And I know that in the US, activists are working to frame gun violence as a public health initiative because suddenly once you've got a public health crisis, it's something the government can act quite unilaterally on without requiring the consent of loads of big corporations. You know, US has a private healthcare system. I'm not, not an expert in that at all, but certainly in, in thinking when I was talking about how we, how we acknowledge the system and its, its tendencies and use those to make new forms of behavior rather than, rather than just resisting, resistance is important, you know, is there an argument to be made about framing the ecological uh, crisis not as a, as a technical issue, which it most often is, it's about which technologies do we choose and why, but making it a health issue, a public health issue, which then makes it something that's much more, um, can be much more quickly activated on in the system because it then becomes about the responsibility of the state to protect its citizens from harm and death. So if loads of hands go up, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything about public health policy, that's just my disclaimer, <laughs> all right? Disclaimer. I, um, I guess, I think like, I guess a, react, a response to that would just be that um, probably the health issues work on a national level and I think like in most cases the sort of uh, fallout of uh, climate change is like uh, less in the countries that you're thinking of maybe, I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah, of course, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I don't know, I'm just, I'm just like, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Once a guy from from Chile started yelling at me because, like, the uh, ozone lit hole had like was like making cows blind in South America, and I was like, well, yeah, so I can't do anything about that. But yeah, it's a kind of terrible point. Like, you know, we we do something in one part of the world, and then uh, the kind of massive effects are are in another 
place. So. Um, there's a really good book I read recently called The Second Body by Daisy Hilliard, which talks about the idea of we have one body, which is our physical self, which is this, and it enacts and it does one thing. And then you have a second body that has an embodied reaction somewhere else in the world because of the result of your first body, which is what I always think about as quite a nice framework to think about the impact that you can have. Because like when you drink a cup of coffee, you have one interaction with it, but actually you're also the one pulling that from, the, from hang on, coffee beans are from plants, aren't they? Mm. I was say from the ground, I was like, that's potatoes. <laughs> um, but the idea of this, the, the, uh, thinking of you, your body not being the limit in some way and not being the, the singular thing that has impact. But again, like you, there, is, there, there are different strategies that are needed in different countries that there are anything else to, to dealing with. We, we can't have a catch-all for everyone because that's just not how it works. Sorry, I did want to add, I think, because I was just thinking about your project, um, Mephi Me Mephitic Air. Uh, and I think in the UK they just found that uh, they started to find like evidence of pollution in, in the like lining of women's pregnant women's uterus. So I suppose you could also I mean it could maybe become more urgent on the level of like uh, yeah this kind of deprival of agency perhaps uh, or deprival of kind of right to a healthy life which maybe would make it much more urgent yeah i mean that that sorry just very quickly because mephitica was a project i did um where we we tracked live pollution data around london and brighton in different ways it was it was installed and then and then visualized it into these large digital projections um and one of the great things about that was it um we got into a twitter argument with transport for london about the fact that their sensors were inaccurate um, and that meant that they had to go and repair their sensors. So again, it was about saying, what's the purpose of doing this work other than getting people to stroke their chins and going, mm, interesting, actually going to TFL and say, through this art project, and it was an art project, we have um, quantitative evidence that the information you are feeding back in your, your yearly reports on the, on this, on the um, pollution on London roads is inaccurate. It's flawed. Um, and that was to do with um, the ventilators in, in particularly in the tunnels, like the Blackwall Tunnel, not functioning for about 10 years and then not just not knowing that was happening. So you can start to, to, to I'm most excited and interested at that end of things, the policy interface and how you can make this meaningful to the, leg to the way that major institutions like Transport for London, like public health, see the world and what they value, what they think is important, I guess. Yeah, I was just gonna add on to what you were saying about changing this from a kind of, um, environmental technology to a public health issue. And one of the most interesting points I think you both raised today, and this is kind of, everyone spoke about like different practical solutions, but you brought up the way that we reframe the language around these things, the kind of the rhetoric or the public discourse. And I wonder if that's, to me, seems like changing the language, thing, like thinking around changing the word cloud to maybe more representation of what it actually is. Is that something you think that could be implemented in some way and, and could contribute quite Positively. Yeah, it's, but it's interesting because all of those words come from marketing language. Yeah. So, so, like, cloud, the cloud came as a way to sell it to people, uh, but sell it to people. Like, it's, it's interesting because I, I did I wrote a chat quite recently about the clouds and data centers, um, including the, the story of a literal cloud appearing in a data center because of a malfunction of the of the cooling system, which is a, an amazing book called Prehistory of the Cloud by Tung Tung Hoi Hung. Um, which is amazing, um, and it's but it, it's interesting because we we if you look at the history of the 50s and add language and the ways in which those things were constructed, obviously they weren't meant to be literal because the idea of literal was boring because it was engineering language and like, only people who are really boring want to know what the literal thing is. It's something like sexy and, and cool and interesting. Um, I mean, you could literally go back and say this is what the cloud is, but but it's it's so embedded within our cultural reference and narrative now that actually it would be really hard to disrupt that. And which is one of the reasons why we even started doing the haunted machines project was because people were talking about like Apple say you're more powerful than you think, and it's just like magic, and you use all these terms because it's a reference that we previously culturally can can refer to. Um, so it's hard because it's it's a, it's as not as we all know it's not just a technological shift in terms of making websites better it's a cultural and behavioural thing and those are the slowest things to change like if you look at Stuart Brand's rates of change which is kind of this circle which says like uh, fashion is moves the fastest and quickest um, technology maybe a little bit in the middle and then culture is always the slowest one to change and to shift. We have eleven exactly this, 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 this is what I mean like and this is why I was mentioning about. Guardians really ramping that up and, and rather than being like oh we're just going to change it every year until someone notices they literally went this is a crisis the world is burning and the same with the Extinction Rebellion for all their flaws as, as Taran said they ha they've, they've really pushed a cultural narrative in a way that we haven't seen for, for, for a while um, 
And I'm glad that they are addressing a lot of the criticisms around being uh, quite white middle class. They, they, they seem to be doing some work around it, which is good. Um, but you're right, it's, 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 it's hard, it's hard <laughs> which is mm. a difficult way. And whether it's a case of whether we just, I don't know, we did a few years ago, there was kind of the campaign for people to change, to Google something to, to web search something, because we'd adopted Google as a term, an active term, like of doing something. Um, what's that called? A verb? That's it. Sorry, yeah. um, that was like an active thing, uh. um, and changing that language. But I, I don't think I know anyone who actually uses that. Yeah, you do. You, just, you do call it. It is its full Christian name, Twitter.com. <laughs> um, but it is. It's, but it's. I guess this is where the, the role, or I think the role of design education is really important. It's nice seeing. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of LCC, which is where, and the UAL in general, um, for the approach that they do take in 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 design education, where they embed the cultural and the, the behavioural and the, and all of that, as well as teaching you how to use Photoshop. So it's like, why do you do this? while you're doing this. I think that's that's more of a change of pedagogy and, and, and pedagogical practice that needs to happen, which I'm seeing adopted really well by people like Charlotte and Connor and everyone actually on, on this panel. I'm not an educator, I don't, I'm just a curator, I don't do anything. <laughs> Damning confession, she doesn't do anything on camera. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's true. Um, um, stop. <laughs> see that upside down. Um, okay, I think we're going to have to wrap things up there. Thank you so much for everyone for coming. Thank you so much to Impact for hosting us. Um, also, thank you to University of the Arts London, uh, the Creative Computing Institute for their support as well, and also for the invitation from Natalie and Tobias and Haunted Machines. Um, and also, um, especially thank you to all the workshop hosts. It was amazing, and I think the um, completely sort of unique perspectives that you brought really really helped shape a, a successful workshop so thank you very much thank you. thanks